Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina McCormick. I'm founder of Resilience Entertainment and co-chair of this committee, along with my co-chair. Hi, I'm Anna Guns. I'm a pediatric intensivist and medical, direct, medical director of the Children's Environmental Health Clinic in Ontario. And we would like to very warmly welcome everyone here today, both in person and online. We are so happy and honored to have all of you participating in this incredibly important um, workshop, which is the third of a four-part series on communities, climate change, and health equity. And if you're in the room with us, you know how important this workshop and this topic is. Today, we are going to focus on really trying to identify key elements of effective and innovative actions to prevent and mitigate inequitable health risks from what we all here know to be one of climate change's most pervasive and critical aspects, which is exposure to extreme heat. So first we would like to start with a land acknowledgement, which is uh, an important part um, to invite um, different ways of knowing and perspectives in this. So while we are gathered virtually today, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional lands of the Nakushtank and the Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and her stewards with relation, with whose relationship spans generations. We recognize that ind Indigenous nations have distinct knowledge systems and ways of knowing that hold wisdom for how to live with the land, respecting this knowledge as we gather to discuss living with extreme health, heat. It is our duty to acknowledge the colonial history that put Indigenous people at the forefront of the climate crisis, to listen and work with those who see with two eyes to create better, better safer communities for all is the future that we all must work and strive to be in. Thank you, Anna. And we would like to also thank before we get started today, we would like to thank the planning committee, the National Academy staff, and today's moderators and participants. Everyone has worked so hard to bring together this very exciting and innovative, and I think what you'll find is very diverse and, um, and broadly speaking event. So before we get into today's workshop, Audrey Tivanon from the National Academies is going to provide you some context for the workshop. Audrey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Give me a second here, sharing my screen. Thank you all for coming uh, today and thank you for the participation online. First, I would like to acknowledge the staff that has been working behind the scene. You have here two uh, core team and uh, our hybrid uh, event lifesaver. We're really trying to make these workshops hybrid participatory for all, and it needs a little, a lot of little ends. So I just wanted to acknowledge the staff. A little bit of logistics. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting. This is not a webinar. So all of you get the opportunity to participate. We made it that way because we really truly think that the power of all the people that are today is gonna make this experience um, uh, rich. Please, if you want to participate in the chat or any other manner, put your names, uh, rename yourself. And uh, if you have a phone number, rename yourself on the chat, on the, on the Zoom uh, participants. Uh, we will use two ways of participation, Slido, which is an outside platform. You will get the link into the chat and also the actual Zoom chat. Please use both of those wisely. Um, we know that participation is difficult, but we want this experience to be um, a, um, a rewarding for all. If you need assistance, find in the chat, uh, Darling. Um, Darlene uh, Gross here will be helping you with, uh, with all of this uh, technical assistance. This workshop is recorded on our website. You can find all the biographies for the speakers, uh, the background material and everything you need um, to know. Sorry, there's a little bit of confusion here with 
Um, there is a clo closed captioning for whoever wants to be uh, reading what we what is said. And again, the recording will be put it on our website. Again, please know that we welcome all of you to be um, participating in this workshop in the way you can. So this activity is part of a over uh, the uh, of overarching initiatives called the Environmental Health Matters Initiative. This is one of the only cross academies initiative really cross the silos of um, science, engineering and medicine. There is a vision statement for these activities. Um, the Environmental Matters Initiative uh, seeks to improve the health of all people equitably by promoting evidence-based, which is one of the important matters for the academies um, based on evidence to the assessment, the prevention, the adaptation, and strategic mitigation of complex and interconnected environmental stressors. The HMI embraces complexity. We think this is a way of, of uh, providing a system thinking that cross those sectors, those disciplines, and any other barriers that we have set for ourselves. We provide with the HMI connection, all of you today, on um, virtually or, or in the room today, uh, credibility with what we've done at the academies for the past almost you know, century and a half, stewardship of the people that are involved, and of course, neutrality. The academies is a nonprofit organization. We advise the government. However, we are a nonprofit, and we embrace this as well. I would like to also acknowledge our uh, sponsors, um, the Center for Disease Controls and Prevention, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and the Environmental Projection Agencies. Uh, those sponsors, uh, in addition for the continuing interest in, those, uh, in tackling those most pressing um, issues, they also recognize the National Academy's core values that are here on the slide of reporting independently for any sponsorship. So today, um, this workshop is part of a series of, uh, this is the third of a four-part uh, four workshop uh, series. Um, this workshop aims to explore the current state of knowledge, which is important for us to have as a base uh, today, about climate-related health diverse disparities and specific action co-produced with change makers and leaders at all levels of decisions. We are not differentiating between those level decisions from the communities all the way to the federal government. And all of this to improve climate health related health outcomes for all. The workshop one, um, during this workshop, we brought together experts, practitioners, scientists, and people with live experience to discuss this proportionate, this proportionate impact of climate change on communities experiencing um, environmental injustices and health disparities. Building on this workshop one, the workshop two looked focus on the state level implementation. Those where the decision can be critical for trickling down in the communities. And this workshop two really aimed at identifying actions that could help improve climate related health outcomes. Today's workshop, we take a topical approach, something that is on people's mind, especially as we're getting in the, the warmer uh, month in, in the United States and on this side of the atmosphere, is um, heat-related climate change impact. We have a fantastic uh, lineup for our committees. I would like to thank, on behalf of the Academy, thank the work that you have done, our co-chairs, Anna and Sabrina, and um, the other member of this committee. So I'm going to take it, um, I'm going to stop my, my uh, presentation right now, and I'm going to ask for Anna to take it take from there. Thank you. I love how we can look at each other now. We're in the same room. It feels funny to look sideways at someone on a Zoom. Um, so the first session, the goals of the first session are to set the stage broadly for our current state of knowledge around heat and the the insidious as well as issues with extreme heat and also identify the gaps um, that we have in terms of health communities and policies. We have a fantastic lineup um, of speakers. So we have David, David Honjula, Rupa Basu, Sanel Jessel, and Reverend Vernon Walker. All biographies can be found on the website. And each speaker will have... Better. 
the goals. Okay. Um, um, to focus on the goals. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. So we will focus on lessons learned in addressing inequalities and health related climate change impacts during the interactive hybrid workshop. The participants will identify key elements of effective actions and prevent mitigation and prevent and mitigate inequitable health risks from one of climate change's most pervasive critical aspects, extreme heat. This multi-day hybrid workshop will convene people with lived experience, environmental health, economic and racial justice experts, climate scientists, energy specialists, and individuals who work on sustainable planning and disaster relief. Together, they will explore a diverse set of real world challenges, affecting different communities and the innovative actions being pursued to prevent, adapt it, or mitigate the health consequences of extreme heat. So our agenda for today, so the first session is basically the current skates of knowledge and identifying gaps um, as well in heat related knowledge regarding health communities and policies. Then we're going to have some shared stories where participants who are going to um, actually are aligned with community needs with while navigating these policies. And session three will be an interactive breakout rooms to identify barriers to implementation and developing solutions. And this is where we really invite the knowledge and expertise that's existing even in the in the universe out there to participate. And then the fourth will be an inspirational talk. Identify problems through different lessons in order to find innovative solutions. Now we can go. And now to session one. I'm sorry. I apologize uh, for the confusion. So this is where we will have those four speakers uh, mentioned above to tackle gaps and barriers. So David Hondula, Rufa Basu, and Sonal Jessel, as well as Reverend Vernon Walker, and their biographies can be found on the website. They'll speak first, each for 10 to 12 minutes, and then there'll be an open Q&A session. Um, the Zoom chat will be disabled during the session and that's where we ask members in the audience to submit questions through slido platform where everyone can also upvote the questions that they want to hear the most so you can sort of influence who what's being asked um and that will will be in the chat the link to that we will address as many of these as possible during this session so first i'm going to pass the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Um, David Hongela, who's the Director of Heat Response and Mitigation for the City of Phoenix, and a faculty member of an Arizona State University School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. Over to you. Good morning, thanks so much, Anna, and confirming you can uh, hear me okay and see the slides? We can. We can. Fantastic. Well, thanks, uh, thanks so much to the academies for the invitation to present. Uh, to the organizers uh, for all your hard work and it's a, an honor to be with the the rest of the panelists here uh, i was asked to try to set the table for us at the stage for our, our great conversation today and i'll be providing a bit of an overture hoping to hit on some of the key themes we heard anna describe sharing a little bit of our local experience here from uh, from phoenix and good morning from arizona to the uh, many participants. I think today's conversation is especially timely as we are right in the middle of what I, I think and hope is a transformation in how communities all across the country are approaching and tackling challenges associated with extreme heat. Uh, here in the picture is, is Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego and our Congressman Ruben Gallego, who are two of our national leaders in trying to advance this conversation. I'll give it a, a local example in, in a moment, uh, but just to highlight, on the floor of the house right now is a proposed legislation to add extreme heat to the Stafford Act, which could potentially open doors for more funding and support for communities all across the country uh, through traditional FEMA disaster planning and response channels. So certainly something uh, to keep our eye on. Again, this is happening quite literally uh, as we speak. Here in Phoenix, our, our mayor and city council took action a couple of years ago now to create a publicly funded office in the structure of local government focused on heat. Here you can see the uh, glamorous City of Phoenix organizational chart, but the key, the key detail I'd like to draw your attention to is the box there. Just like Phoenix has a police department, a water department, a neighborhood services department, now we have a heat department charged with harnessing the power and energy of the entire organization to help our community and indeed communities across the region and state tackle the many challenges related to heat. So in, in the, uh, responding to the prompt about the state of knowledge, I wanted to share a few of our reflections 
on what the, the body of knowledge is that motivated Phoenix to take this action. And then I'll talk about some of the lessons learned through our first couple of journeys that hopefully will touch on some, some knowledge gaps that we can, as a community, work to fill. I think there are at least five pieces of the knowledge base that motivated Phoenix to take this action to quite literally change the structure of local government to tackle heat, uh, recognition of the significant public health risk, hearing from the community that heat is a concern, a very strong state of knowledge, I would argue, about how the climate system works and how the urban climate system works, recognition that heat is a multi-sectoral, multi-faceted challenge involving not just environmental dimensions, and of course, heat as an environmental justice topic, the motivating factor for our time together today. Uh, we will hear from other speakers about public health data related to heat, uh, but I just wanted to, to highlight as we're thinking about heat as a public health risk, uh, that there are wide opportunities for how we frame that risk. And here locally, a particularly impactful contribution came from our media partners at the Arizona Republic, who took the time to interview friends, family members, and others who knew heat decedents in our community. This was a story, a series of stories published in uh, 2017. And we found these narratives to be particularly impactful, not just in influencing our local policymakers, but also in bringing institutional actors to the table. Uh, we would look at these narratives, read these narratives together and ask where could we have fit in to make a difference in how these stories uh, played out. And unfortunately, I uh, had very tragic outcomes. So not, not just the public health administrative records uh, important here, but also the narratives and storytelling. Uh, we hear from the community quite a lot about heat, perhaps naturally so, as the, the hottest large city in the country. One of the indicators we saw that, that uh, shows this priority is that our public budget hearings, a number of years ago when the heat office was proposed, there were very few parts of the city budget that received more positive public comments uh, than the idea that we should create a heat office and do better as a community in managing heat. I think a, a particularly instrumental uh, a piece of the puzzle there in, in garnering and building community support has been the work of the Nature Conservancy here locally with community-based nonprofits uh, who have been convening for the past couple of years now what they call the Urban Heat Leadership Academy, bringing neighbors, residents, community leaders together uh, to come up with more of a collective vision, collective voice for how we can move the community forward and also build capacity and relationships between academic institutions, public institutions, and neighborhood associations as well. Uh, with respect to climate knowledge and the urban climate system. Uh, here at Arizona State uh, University, uh, we've certainly been investing a lot in this topic uh, for many, many uh, decades now. And, and I think that this, where the state of the science is and the, the finding about how impactful urban actors are in shaping the climate of the urban environment is another motivational point that, uh, that encouraged our mayor and, and city council to create the heat office. Here's one example published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science uh, almost a decade ago now. And I know there's a lot happening on, on this, this figure. We can get into it more in the discussion, but I'll just draw your attention uh, to the area in these yellow circles. We can see all the boxes are to the left of some zero line. And the fact that those boxes are on the left of some zero line says that it tells us that actions that cities can take can produce cities of the future that are cooler than the ones we have today, even as global warming continues. All those boxes left of zero means that our cities can be cooler in the future. That's been a very powerful message uh, for our local elected officials here, that cities can really make a difference in shaping the environment for their residents. Recognizing the multi-dimensional aspect of heat, I think, motivated our, our city council to take action. This is a figure that, that we published a number of years ago. The bars show how many heat-associated deaths happened to our community, and the symbols, the, the lines that move up and down, show how many we would have expected just based on the weather conditions. And in 2016, at the far right-hand side, you can see that where the symbols wind up is nowhere near the top of the bars. Something else happened in our community in 2016 that pushed heat associated deaths way above where we would have expected them to be uh, just based on weather conditions alone. And we're continuing to diagnose and unpack uh, what, what that story is. Uh, finally, recognition that heat is an environmental justice uh, topic, perhaps no topic more clearly than heat. Uh, I think many on the line have seen and produced figures like this uh, that show uh, in our case here in Phoenix, hot neighborhoods have a higher incidence of heat-related illness. 
Uh, but I think we're seeing more and different types of data fit into that narrative as well. Uh, here's some, some work from an interview and storytelling project we had the chance to be part of with the Nature Conservancy <clears throat> and community-based organizations. Uh, getting a different sense here beyond dots on a figure of what the impacts of heat are uh, in our communities. As you can see on the slide here, kids don't really go outside to play because it's too hot, concern about the long-term chronic illnesses that might come about uh, from that lack of activity in the summertime. So those are a few of the data points that have contributed to where we are today, the state of knowledge that motivated our mayor and city council to take action to create a heat office. What do we need to do moving forward? And I'll also offer five ideas here. Clearer and community rooted goals related to heat, consistent and accessible health data as related to heat. I think we can make a greater investment in evaluation. I think we need to find new and better ways to get researchers sitting alongside city staff and indeed uh, institutional actors at all scales and finally, I'll share a thought about heat portfolio management. With respect to goals, I'll come back to that quote that we just shared before. Kids don't uh, really go outside to play because it's too hot. So when, when I, especially as a new parent, when I try to think about what a goal looks like for tackling that challenge, it looks to me like the picture on the left here, a very nicely shaded playground uh, in our neighboring community of Mesa. When I think about the goals that we are writing as an institutional community of heat actors, our goals tend to be based on the picture of the right, on the right, a weather station based at Sky Harbor Airport where almost nobody spends uh, any portion of their time. When we're thinking about reducing the urban heat island, for example, I think we're missing what the community is telling us about how they're experiencing heat as a challenge. And I think we need to find better ways to construct goals that are more related to the slide there and less related to the temperature as we would measure it at an airport. Uh, we'll talk more about health data, I'm sure, with some of our other panelists, but just to highlight the scale of the challenge we have uh, across the United States right now. Uh, at the same time, we have the National Weather Service reporting that we have about 100 heat-related uh, deaths every year, the CDC reporting about 700. In Maricopa County, we reported nearly 500 last year, and uh, in the academic community, we have estimates well north of 10,000 per year. If uh, Mayor Bloomberg was correct uh, that if we can't measure it, we can't manage it, clearly our measurement isn't precise enough yet for heat to be able to effectively manage the public health risks. Investment in evaluation, I think we have a long way to go here. And uh, I wanna applaud the Street Transportation Department here at the city of Phoenix. I was been a pioneer in trying reflective surfaces on our, our, on our city streets. You can see on the left picture there, the street that goes vertically on the slide uh, seems to have a zebra pattern. It's halfway through receiving its cool pavement treatment. And the Street Transportation Department invested in a very rigorous evaluation process with our uh, partners at ASU, from which important academic and uh, scholarship is coming forward, but also important practical advice that's helping us think about where in the city cool pavement may make more sense and where it might make less sense. I think this type of evaluation, we can really scale up. For example, all the dots on the map here show where our public cooling centers and hydration stations are in the Phoenix area. What is the collective impact of this service on reducing heat associated deaths and illnesses? While the CDC is helping us make investments in answering that question through the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects program, I think we still have a long way to go there. And how do we think about other community investments as part of this evaluation story that have heat co-benefits? Like when the city opened a new shelter for people experiencing homelessness last year, I am very confident it was very heat protective, but I can't put a specific number on it yet. And as we uh, hit the end of, uh, end of my introductory slides here, two final points for you. How can we get our researchers sitting alongside city staff uh, more often? Uh, I don't know about all of you on the call, but I know I've spent a lot of time developing uh, vulnerability maps and models at the polygon scale, the neighborhood scale, and have only recently really learned the nuances of what it takes, for example, to implement a tree planting program. Here's just a screenshot from one of our internal tools at the city. And when we think about places to plant trees in Phoenix from the city government perspective, 
It's not these big polygons that we're concerned about. It's these little teeny tiny ones. This little green strip along the street are the actual places where the city could take action right now to plant trees. Those types of nuanced details, we really need to get more in our workflow. And finally, I'll end with a little bit on our, our heat portfolio management. While I think we collectively have a good sense of what we can do, how much of each of those actions we should be uh, investing in, who should be implementing them and who do they benefit remain open questions, I would argue. And as we think about that, I'll leave us with uh, these three narratives that my colleague, Melissa Bardaro detected that emerged from interviews she conducted in our region. She found these three narratives for different people in our community. Heat is an inconvenience. Heat is a manageable problem for others. And heat is a catastrophe for others. And as we're thinking about what we're doing related to heat, I think we need to be figuring out a way to measure how much of the risk related to heat is shared, uh, it falls into these three different buckets. And does that really reflect, uh, is that really reflected in the investments we're taking uh, right now? Uh, with that, thank you so much again to the Academies. Looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists and our vigorous Q&A coming up. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is uh, Rupa Basu, who is currently the Chief of the Air and Climate Epidemiology Section at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment of the California Environmental Protection Agency. That is a mouthful. That is a title. Um, so today she will be talking about ambient health exposures and health environmental justice implications as well. We can see yourself. Thank you so much, you. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. And um, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about some of the epidemiologic work that has been done on heat exposure and health, and also some of the environmental justice implications of that work. So I think we've all seen, uh, David just showed us some um, deaths that have occurred in Maricopa County in Arizona. But we've all seen these headlines now, um, whether it's in Oregon or California or India, um, Australia, Russia, um, throughout Europe. Probably the largest um, that we've seen uh, so far has been the uh, following the 2003 European heat wave, where there were about 70,000 deaths following that. And we know from research that heat is the number one killer of all um, climate change exposure. So very important to study just for that reason alone. Many of you have probably heard about this climate gap in that the poorest areas are not uh, the most, even though they're the most affected by climate change, they're not the biggest carbon emitters. Um, this we can see on a global scale. So starting with um, the US, uh, Russia, India, China are some of the largest carbon emitters, but you can see here that Sub-Saharan Africa, South America are more um, largely impacted. Now, if you take this to a national scale, same thing happens. Um, the poorest are most affected, even though they may not be the largest emitters. And then in my work, um, working for the state of California, we see this in California as well. And then if you go even smaller than that into local communities, we see that climate change uh, gap as well. Um, David just mentioned that we see about 700 annual deaths that are reported from the Centers for Disease Control. That is a very large um, underreporting, and I'll get into the reasons for that in a, in a minute. But um, I just want to say that if you're thinking about 700 annual deaths, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. Yes, it's still a public health uh, problem. But when we're thinking about the true implications of thousands and thousands of deaths, um, it's quite different. So the reasons why heat-related deaths and illnesses are often underreported um, in the United States is that we have no systematic definition for a heat wave. It really varies by local health department or region. And the vulnerable subgroups are so different. Um, in heat advisories, we really need to address that that these advisories need to uh, protect locally vulnerable subgroups. An example of a heat wave is that it's 98th percentile of temperature distribution in a specific geographic area for at least two or more days. But again, but again there is no systematic definition for this. Um, when considering heat wave definitions, it's also in, 
um, important to think about daytime versus nighttime thresholds because when there's a, not a chance to cool down, um, that's when we see some of the largest um, health impacts and also when there's a cumulative effect of heat over several days. So another reason for this um, underreporting is also with the outcome. There's heat related deaths or illnesses are reported only during the heat wave, which causes um, a surveillance bias in epidemiology or when no other cause of death or illness is suspected. So from our studies, we know that there are several other health outcomes that need to be considered when looking at heat. Um, previously, we would consider only mortality um, and then went on to look at dehydration and heat illness, which obviously has a very large impact, but other health outcomes such as cardiovascular outcomes, um, particularly heart attacks, um, ischemic stroke, uh, respiratory, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, mental health outcomes, which is fairly new um, in terms of epidemiologic studies. That includes suicides, homicides, as well as, well as neurotic and um, psychotic outcomes, such as schizophrenia, um, liver and kidney diseases, um, infectious diseases, gastrointestinal diseases, and then finally, um, adverse birth outcomes, preterm delivery, low birth weight, and stillbirth. These have also been studied more recently in the last um, decade. So next I wanna just talk about the mechanism of how heat stress can lead to death. As you can see, it's pretty complicated. Um, this is a figure that my colleague and I developed for a book chapter. And I'm gonna just focus on the, the real uh, mechanism that is mostly seen in um, the literature. So dehydration, um, which leads to electrolyte imbalance, heat exhaustion, heat injury, heat stroke, or heat collapse uh, eventually leads to death. So dehydration has so many different symptoms. Some of them could just be um, vomiting, feeling lightheaded, dizzy, um, and these are often overlooked and not connected to the heat exposure. And this is really important to think about to prevent heat-related um, illness or, or death. So some of the high-risk populations for ambient heat exposure. When I started this research um, now over two decades ago, we really thought it was um, the elderly that was most impacted, but um, that is one of the subgroups. But we also need to think about other subgroups such as socially isolated populations, pregnant people, children, outdoor workers such as farm workers, um, taking certain medications such as beta blockers and antidepressants. As I said earlier, heart disease and mental health diseases are related to heat. So these could modify um, if somebody is taking some of these medications may not be able to act um, during a heat wave, take action. Um, living on, high, um, on the top floor of high rise buildings or other building um, infrastructure issues. Um, poverty, which is measured in so many different ways. Young athletes, which is often a population uh, missed. And um, there are others, but during heat advisories, many of these populations are currently missed. So young athletes and pregnant people, for example, are not reported as being uh, high risk in certain areas. And this is important and has important public health implications because if people don't know they're at increased risk, they won't be taking precautions or any kind of interventions. So some of the reasons for these uh, disparities is in the exposure itself. So we know that there's greater exposures to heat and air pollution, which is often called environmental racism or environmental justice. Certain communities live closer to power plants, fossil fuel combustion areas, freeways, um, and are also more prone to the urban heat island effect, which just means that there's more blacktops, um, cements, um, and other things that absorb heat and retain it um, compared to uh, rural or uh, semi-urban areas. And this is all a result 
of, or mostly a result of historical redlining. The health outcomes themselves, if we don't even look at these exposures, um, if you don't look at heat or um, air pollution, we still see a disparity by health outcomes, um, primarily by race ethnicity. Um, there is some evidence to show that lower socioeconomic status um, is also an issue. The high cost of using air conditioning, for example, or if there's a wildfire um, or a heat wave, relocation may not be feasible um, because of work or um, not having the means to go elsewhere. There's also evidence to show that there's less access to health care or using the emergency room for primary care. But the most important thing here is that even with the same access to health care, the same socioeconomic status, there may be differential treatment um, in the healthcare setting. This is something that really needs to be addressed. And the differential treatment is primarily by skin color, not believing patients um, or not treating them the same in the same way. So here are some ways that our study results are used. Um, we try to publish everything, um, but it's so important to not just keep this research in the scientific world. Um, it's so important to get this information out to uh, physicians, um, healthcare workers, uh, populations at risk, the general public. And we try to do that in so many different ways. We present this work at work uh, workshops such as this one, uh, meetings um, and scientific conferences, but also develop fact sheets, um, provide consultations to other governments and non nonprofit agencies. Um, we deliver scientific messages through uh, public uh, to the public via uh, media interviews and also um, um, some uh, shows and um, other ways that we've tried to um, convey this information. Um, also have implemented policy changes. We've started this with the local health departments. In California, we just had a couple of bills pass. There's the SB 65, which is the momnibus. There's also a federal momnibus uh, that is trying to improve maternal and fetal health outcomes. Um, there's AB 2238 and 2240, for example, in California. These just passed this year, um, which proposes to develop a state statewide heat ranking and naming system. And then another bill, the 2240, focuses uh, primarily on perinatal infant children's health from extreme heat. So these were developed based on the epidemiologic work that I have been um, presenting in these slides. Another way that our research has been used in California itself, we have uh, published this fourth climate change assessment. This was developed at the same time that the US EPA developed their fourth climate change assessment. But we thought it was really important to look at California specifically um, because of our microclimates and diverse population. There's so many different climate change impacts that we experience in California alone. Um, temperature, which I covered here, but there's also things like sea level rise, snowpack, heavy pre uh, precipitation events, which we really experienced a lot this year, drought um, and wildfires, which have been become more severe in the past five years. So what are some of the things that we could do about heat um, exposure? This is more individual um, precautions that we can take, um, some things that we could do now, some things that we could do during a heat wave. Um, there's so many different interventions. And of course, they're very um, local or even individual, um, der individually derived. Um, and for more information, you can visit this website. And um, the good news is that most of this is preventable. These heat related illnesses and deaths and other health outcomes are preventable. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the 70,000 deaths that we uh, observed in following the 2003 heat wave in Europe. Since then, many of those countries have developed a heat health action plan but there's been other areas that have also developed plans, um, such as Montreal, um, some cities throughout the US and counties. We're still trying to develop a plan uh, in California. But most of these occur following a major heat wave 
episode. In Chicago, their plan uh, followed the 1995 and 1999 um, heat waves. And so, so much of this needs to be done as a, a precaution. Um, the interventions that we talked about, I know David mentioned some of them, need to be very locally um, derived as well. And um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for your attention and um, I look forward to the other panelists and the discussion following. Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Sanal Jessel, who is Director of Policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. And thank you. Um, let me just get my presentation up. Okay, we hear you and see you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, great. Well, uh, thanks to the, the two panelists before. It's great to uh, hear from you all and, and learn about the work that you're you're doing. I think what I'm about to say will align um, very nicely. Um, so my name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the Director of Policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. We are a community-based organization in Harlem and New York City. There we go. And um, we were started out of a fight against the placement of a sewage treatment plant in West Harlem, which was considered an act of environmental racism, as at the, the time Harlem was already um, saddled with a number of environmentally hazardous facilities in the neighborhood that was already leading to um, environmental health impacts from air quality and, and water contamination. And so just another facility placed on top was um, a, 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 an act that um, our founders ended up protesting, which helped us start We Act. And so to this day, what we do is we fight in for environmental justice, which is that everyone deserves to live, um, work, play, pray, and learn in a healthy environment, and that we work to undo environmental racism, which is discrimination interpersonally, but also on that systemic level and um, institutional level. We're trying to undo racism and fight racism on that policy level when it comes to how we make decisions about what goes in neighborhoods and how we build healthy communities. So as was said, heat waves are increasing in severity, frequency, and duration. For New York City, this is a major concern because we are a very, very dense city. And what we have is the urban heat island effect, which makes us even more vulnerable to extreme heat. So we have um, uh, temperatures that can be many degrees warmer than our neighboring sub suburbs outside of New York City. And that's because we have just tons of buildings, cars, concretes, um, um, and, and, and all these different factors that lead us to have really um, hot neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to extreme heat for WE Act, we think about it from the um, equity perspective that not everybody is affected equally when it comes to extreme heat and not everyone actually is exposed to the same amount of extreme heat throughout the city. So like was said in the presentation before, um, when you zoom down into that neighborhood level, you do see there's disparities in, in temperature and ability to kind of um, protect yourself from, from the heat. <clears throat> so when we talk about extreme heat, um, most kind of classically, we talk about older adults being very vulnerable, children, people that have chronic illnesses like asthma, respiratory illnesses, people who are pregnant, people who are working outdoors. Um, for us in New York City, we have a lot of construction workers and delivery um, people that are, that are moving around all the time. Um, but there's also, in addition to the story that we look at at WE Act, um, we're thinking about people that are living in apartment buildings that are poorly maintained and are very hot. So we have an issue where apartment buildings do not cool down at night. Um, <clears throat> so people are exposed to the heat 24 hours a day, which is where you see that health impact happen. People that live in crowded apartments, so you're sharing your, your fans or your ACs or you're just kind of cramped in a tight space. If you're living in a neighborhood that doesn't have as many trees or as many parks, which we know is all um, in part due to the history of redlining, um, and as well as for neighborhoods that have air pollution issues and more industrial sites that contribute to heat and air pollution. Um, people that are already dealing with a number of hardships where extreme heat is really a amplifier, to me, it's a risk amplifier where um, if you're already dealing with issues, paying your rent, for example, extreme heat 
is um, very can be very hard on you because you might be having trouble paying your electricity bill to run your AC system, for example. Um, so when we talk about extreme heat, we actually look at it from like a very intersectoral um, and nuanced perspective in terms of the solutions. And so our main focus is how are we um, helping to improve environmental health impacts from extreme heat? How do we reduce the fact that it is the number one weather related killer that we do see hundreds of people hospitalized or going to the ER or passing away from extreme heat? Um, how do we really address that issue? And we know for, for we act a lot of that comes down to looking at policies that we consider to be um, have a history in environmental racism and how are we kind of shifting that and putting out policies and programs that are um, protecting the people that we deem are most vulnerable and haven't received investments and protections um, for many generations. <clears throat> So um, this is the, the core of what I'm talking about is just some policy examples of things that we work on um, when it comes to addressing extreme heat. And um, it is quite a nuanced and complex issue, <clears throat> which is, um, you know, leads you to have a lot of really interesting solutions. I think it was kind of also mentioned in the previous um, presentations that a lot of time when it comes to extreme heat, um, creating spaces or, or and protecting people from extreme heat tends to also be the same type of solutions um, for other issues that you might see in a community. So, um, you know, if you have a, a desire like the, the like Dr. Hondula mentioned, the parks, um, children needing a place to go play. Um, well, there's a way to build that in a way that is also protective of extreme heat, for example. Or we talk about building a lot of um, green space to help with flooding, to help um, with uh, carbon emissions, but also what that is doing is cooling down um, the city and providing shade as well, um, which helps with extreme heat. Um, so there's a lot of the times the policies that we push forward are um, really addressing multiple issues at one time. So one of them is indoor extreme heat protections. That's something we focus on a lot. We heard from um, our membership, which is about 800 people in Northern Manhattan, that um, first and foremost, when it's really hot, people want to stay home and they want to stay safe in their homes. And so how do we do that? That all comes down to uh, helping low-income households live in sustainable and affordable um, homes where they can access the cooling that they need. Um, and so that's something that we're pursuing is not only how are we kind of uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels, but for us now this translates into the extreme heat work, how do we make sure we are um, funding for low income buildings to actually be putting in more energy efficient um, systems in their buildings to help people cool down in an affordable way? Um, how are we making sure that there's actually limits on how hot a building can get and who is responsible for that? And um, another aspect of that is community spaces, uh, senior centers, youth centers, libraries, um, what have you should also be responsible for providing cooling or staying under a certain temperature maximum. Um, another policy bucket that we have is the neighborhood level protections. So uh, cooling centers were also mentioned. That's something that, that New York City has. However, most people don't know about them and most people do not go to them. But we do find that um, in New York City, people do tend to go to cooling centers if they actually are some, if there's like another reason to go. So the most frequented cooling set, type of cooling center in New York City is the public libraries because you have, um, and senior centers as well, because you have whole populations of people that maybe would have been doing that anyway on a Saturday afternoon. So how are we uh, looking at um, spaces to become cooling centers that are spaces that people actually want to go to for reasons outside of just um, getting uh, uh, some cooling. Um, because we found that in schools, for example, that opened as cooling centers uh, in emergencies, they weren't really used at all. Nobody wants to sit in an empty room just to be cool, and they don't pick to do that. Um, the other thing is heat alerts. That was also mentioned. Um, that's something in New York City that we're looking at is how do we uh, create some kind of a better alert system because we find that the um, perception of extreme heat risk is quite low. Um, and then uh, in terms of number three, and when it comes to green spaces, 
Um, what is really important is ensuring that our sit, our neighborhoods have um, adequate tree canopy, but even beyond that, because sometimes there's um, issues with putting tree canopy on sidewalks that maybe cannot host that anymore, how do we also make sure that we're um, encouraging residents to maintain the green spaces in their yard, in, the, in their front yards, in their backyards? How do we make sure that parks are not just concrete, but are green, have lawns, um, and have shade? Um, so these are some really important different kinds of policies that we work on. Um, I'll skip that. But then lastly, I'll also touch on for WE Act is that we um, run a heat health and equity initiative. And what we create every year for the past couple of years is a policy agenda for extreme heat where we outline all of the things we would like to see done um, in New York City to address the issue of extreme heat. And it includes a huge range of policies, um, some of which I just touched on very broadly, um, but they, they include some more specific recommendations. And we do have the 2023 agenda coming out later this month. So we encourage everyone to watch for that um, because it will also contain a lot of really good examples that uh, I'm sure are very easy to, to translate into other municipalities and other places across the US. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. I think there was a lot of people nodding along with what you were saying, it's incredible work. So our last speaker for this se session is um, Reverend Vernon Walker, who is a program director of Communities Responding to Extreme Weather and a graduate student working towards earning a master's degree in public policy at Tufts University Department of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning Department. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having trouble with these ands, these long titles. Uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, those ands can uh, get you caught up after a while. Uh, well, um, I'm glad to be with you all. In fact, I'm elephant happy and hippopotamus glad to be with you all uh, to enjoy in this conversation. And it's really been insightful. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen to share with you uh, some of the work uh, that crew has uh, been uh, doing around extreme heat. Uh, so we are going to, to get this ball rolling here. I assume you all can see this. Um, so yes. yes, let us. All right, fantastic. Uh, that's what I like. I like to hear that. Uh, and we will. Let's see here. We will. We're just getting this together here. All right. All right, woo! Now, you know, the glass has shattered. Um, and we got some really fancy transitions here. Uh, so uh, before we begin and before we go into the work of what we've been doing, we're going to just share who CREW is and uh, give an organizational background. So CREW is a young grassroots program that aims to build equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience in New England through hands-on education, service, and planning. So we'll explain uh, how or what that looks like in the terms of extreme heat. We're based uh, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and we are a program under the Better Future Project, uh, and CREW has been in existence since 2018. Uh, I myself have been with the uh, program since 2019. All right, so let's talk about extreme heat. So I got a chart for you all. We've been hearing throughout about throughout this panel about extreme heat and the devastating numbers, a name, uh, numbers of how people are dying in New York and in Phoenix and other places. What I'm going to do is draw a national context. Uh, and this chart comes from NOAA, the National, a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So I just want to point out, and this is no surprise to all of us that are in, engaged in this work, that we, extreme heat is the leading killer of extreme weather across the United States. The numbers bear it out. Uh, what we see here is that in 2000 and 2021, uh, 375 people died across the United States because of extreme heat. And in some ways, people feel that this number is underrepresented. Uh, uh, concurrently, we see that the amount of people that died in 2021, 2021 because of floods is 
uh, 146 on the chart. We see that lightning has killed 11 people. We see that tornadoes have killed 104 people. We see hurricanes 12. We see winter 40. And again, I'm just focusing on the red bars. But this chart does not only do, this chart does not only juxtapose what happened in 2021, but this chart also juxtaposed a 30-year average. Uh, so uh, traverse with me, if you will, to look at the yellow bars. We still see that extreme heat is the leading killer of extreme weather over a 30 year period of 1992 to 2021. Uh, uh, per year, 164 people have died. And some years it has been higher. In 1995, uh, 739 people died in Chicago because of a five day heat wave. Uh, the city that I'm from, Philadelphia, in 1993, 120 people have died uh, because of a heat wave. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we realize and recognize that extreme heat is deadly, dangerous, and disastrous. Uh, and also, as we mentioned, the numbers bear it out. We've heard throughout this uh, uh, from our esteemed panelists and throughout this segment of uh, how heat. Is a multi is a is a, uh, is a threat multiplier. Uh, so again, we see the numbers here uh, of, of bearing out the, day, the the gravity in which extreme heat should be dealt with. Uh, so we're going to go to the next slide here. All right. So now I'm going to just focus in on New England. Now we big big national. Now I'm just going to focus more so on Massachusetts. Um, and we see uh, this is actually from uh, the WBUR, uh, uh, which is our NPR station. Uh, or our NPR, well, WBUR is affiliated with NPR. Um, and we are expected to see uh, over 31 days of extreme heat in the Massachusetts area uh, by, 20, by, by 2044. Uh, by 2084, uh, we are expected to see, and again, we know there's are tipping points, but this just gives us an idea of what's happening uh, around New England um, and what will happen uh, and what could happen, that we could experience over 60 degrees of temperature over 90 degrees. Uh, so 60 days of temperature over 90 degrees. Um, and uh, we know that in, some, in summertime in the Boston and greater Boston area is, is, is 91 days. So we're talking, folks, uh, that the majority of the summer will be dangerous for folks to go out. And we heard the categories of people that are at risk. Uh, and we're going to just talk a little bit about what we do from the community engagement piece uh, and, and from the community engagement side of things to deal with environmental justice communities. So you have this chart uh, and you see this chart. And again, I'm highlighting how much extreme hot days we're expected to deal with in uh, Boston and the greater Boston area. All right, so this is an urban heat island. So we've heard urban heat islands mentioned. Uh, so this is just an area, this is just a map of the greater Boston area. So what we see here is that there are areas that are bright, dark orange. So uh, for the, many of you who have probably flown in uh, to Logan Airport and are very familiar with Logan Airport, uh, that is, uh, that's in East Boston, and that is considered an environmental justice community, uh, not only because of heat, but also because it incessantly floods. Uh, so essentially, what we see here is that, you know, this dark orange here, so this is uh, an environment, an E&J community. We see, uh, we see parts of Cambridge, uh, where I live. I live in Cambridge. So we see parts in Somerville. We see parts of it experienced from the, uh, uh, we see parts that experience the urban heat island effect because of a lot of the impervious surface. And then we're going to come down to, uh, to Ashmont. Uh, this is in the Dorchester area right here. Uh, what we see here is a lot of other dark orange, and we see a lot of you know, a lot of uh, asphalts and uh, black roofs and uh, lack of green space. So what we see here is that these communities uh, that are experiencing the urban heat island effect, and this, uh, the, 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 this map comes also from WBUR. Uh, I want to focus uh, a little bit on this area, uh, the, the, the Ashmont area, the Dorchester area, uh, but I'll, I'll revisit that in a second. So you have a visual here of what the urban heat island effect looks like for the Boston and greater Boston area. All right, so what is CREW doing about this? So we have climate resilience hubs. Uh, you, on our website, uh, www.climatecrew.org, 
we have we work we have over 130 hubs across the United States uh, and one in Canada. And hubs are community institutions, uh, community anchoring institutions like libraries, churches, uh, libraries, faith communities, uh, community centers, nature centers, etc. Um, so these two, the reason I highlight these two right here is because. Uh, Crew has partnered with these two organizations. Not only are they hubs, but they're, we've also partnered with them to provide, uh, which I'll show a picture of later, uh, air conditioner, cool, uh, energy efficient air conditioner unit and cooling kits. Uh, so uh, we essentially work with these uh, organizations to help prepare their community members for extreme weather. And a lot of times what we do is we provide information on best practices to prepare for uh, heat or hurricanes or floods or tornadoes or wildfires, et cetera. Uh, because, and because we have, because our health program is national, uh, different parts of the country face different threats from extreme weather. Uh, so again, these are our hubs. If you want more information about our hubs, please do visit our website. Uh, but the, again, these two hubs we partnered with in 2022 to do, to conduct best practice workshop, uh, workshops, uh, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, so this is a picture from last summer. Uh, this is, and, and we're also going to be doing these workshops this summer too. So what we do is we provide these resources, but not only do we provide resources like air conditioners and cooling kits, and I'll touch on cooling kits in a second, but we also have workshop on best practices to stay cool. And we, we partnered with Mass General Hospital. That's why you see Mass General Brigham, uh, which is a system which Mass General Hospital is under. Um, we partnered and ha had this event on how to stay healthy in summer heat. Uh, so there's the crew logo there. We met the Mass Audubon. So that the Mass Audubon, the Nature Center, is one of our hubs. And we also partnered with the Ma Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition to do organizing to because we believe in working with uh, organizations that are rooted in the community that we uh, work with together to organize and get the word out so residents can come to these workshops. So these workshops are normally held in the evening. We also provide food because we know that uh, in uh, places like uh, some parts in places like the South End and Dorchester and Madison um, and Brockton, people are also not only the environmental justice community, but people are also dealing with food insecurity. So we also provide we buy food from local businesses and get that catered and, and make sure we have that. And then we raffle off air conditioners uh, because we don't have an unlimited. Uh, OK. Um, we, we don't have an unlimited supply. And I'm going to be wrapping this up in just a second. Uh, maybe. Maybe somebody should mute because I think I hear something. Uh, I don't know if someone's talking to me or someone's talking to somebody in the background, but at um, any rate, uh, so yeah, just have a couple more slides and I'm gonna get out your way. Uh, so that's our workshop. Uh, that's what we have been doing because we believe empowering people with knowledge so they can prepare for extreme heat, not just giving, not just us giving out resources. And I also want to parenthetically say that in 2020, uh, the city of New York uh, provided uh, 73,000 air conditioning units. So um, I didn't see evidence that they provided uh, uh, workshops, but they all, they had a mass AC distribution, which you know many of you all know. Um, and also, I should have said this in the beginning, but I want to thank the the National Science Academy for, for organizing this and putting this together. So uh, while that's belated, I also wanted to throw that in there as well. Um, so, all right, so we're coming down to the con cl closing of this. So this is uh, someone that received the air conditioner. You can see the bright smile, you know, and we've, uh, you know, we've got funding to pay. We, we received grants to pay for these air conditioners. Uh, so you see these air conditioners, you see a truck full of air conditioners in the back. So that's normally how we transport the AC units. Um, and then you'll see like this bright orange kit. Uh, you may be wondering what's in it. Well, actually, I'm so glad you asked because uh, I'm here to tell you. Uh, so what's in our kit? Uh, these kits right here is water, electrolyte tablets, uh, cool patches, thermometers. And these are designed for, to, for people to take with them when they're going outside uh, so they can treat heat exhaustion, as you can see, relief for heat exhaustion. Uh, and really, this, is, this, this little mobile kit is designed uh, to be on the go, especially for outdoor workers. Uh, someone mentioned earlier how outdoor workers are uh, at, at risk, uh, but also um, that's what we do at Crew. Uh, so we're here, we're 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 helping prepare people on the ground, uh, and we're targeting E and J communities. We'll do it again this summer uh, in in the city of Brockton, which is about forty five to fifty minutes away from the Boston area. Uh, but also, there's a bill in the state house, and then I'm going to close with this, and then I'm going to, and then we're going to get into the Q and A. Um, 
There is a bill in the state house. Uh, it's called uh, the Massachusetts State House. It's called an act uh, promoting resilience against uh, the heat related impacts of climate change. So Bill S-2097, there's a hearing next month. So basically if this bill passes in, in, in our state legislator, it will provide reimbursement for folks to buy uh, fans uh, not exceeding $75 and also air and a reimbursement of air conditioner uh, units, uh, not more than $500. Uh, so what's going on is, um, uh, people were being reimbursed, and this is designed for elderly and for for under folks that lived in underserved communities and low income. But again, this bill has not passed yet. But if you want more information, Bill S twenty ninety seven, and I know this will be recorded. Uh, and with that, I'm going to put a pin on it because I know we have to transition to Q and A, and we're really so glad to hear uh, some questions and take some questions and answer some questions. Uh, so with that, I'm going to put a pin on it and uh, stop my presentation as we proceed on. Thank you very much for that. That was an excellent collection of talks. And I think, you know, we, we heard from Dr. Hanjula who talked about sort of the need for community interaction and research and some of the solutions. And Dr. Bazu who talks about health data measurement and the importance of thinking beyond um, deaths to sort of the more nuances. And Ms. Jessel about this intersectional thinking and action and heat is a risk amplifier. And then to to Reverend Walker there, who sort of zoomed in and out through community action um, and talked about really scalable solutions. So thank you all for that. Um, for the q and I think um, the first thing that we'd like to sort of throw back to you, and, and if you could all maybe answer from your own lens and perspective, is how do you, how can we deal with the cumulative health risks. So this compounding of, you know, even secondary factors like heat, or we've heard wildfires or, um, you know, evacuations, gun violence, like all of these things interact. And, you know, I think with some of this, there's the, the issue between, you know, fear and inciting action, but also, um, you know, finding, building practical solutions from each of your lens. Um, what are your perspectives on those? Perhaps, you know, we can walk backwards, maybe. Reverend Walker, would you like to to tackle that one first? Or is there anyone who wants to speak to that? Uh, yeah, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that again? I lost a little bit of you. Could you repeat that question again? And I'll be happy to provide a, a short answer. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, so how do we deal with that? The, the cumulative health risks as well of, you know, it's, it's when we talk about heat, then it's, you know, the risks are amplified by things like air pollution. Um, and the impacts that you see this on the, on the community are these are these conversations about cumul cumulative health risks when you're dealing with it, or is it focused on heat waves? Uh, for us and our workshop, and thank you so much for that again. For us, that's why we partner with uh, Mass General Hospital Center for Environment and Health, of which I sit on the advisory board at. So we we and we partner with other, the doctors from other uh, uh, medical institutions here and hospitals because. We bring we want we bring these physicians in to talk about this is how you know that you're experiencing heat exhaustion. This is how you know that you're experiencing heat stroke. So in our workshops, what I didn't mention because we know this is related to climate change, and I didn't really talk about that, but um, we are very intentional about connecting what we are experiencing now to the climate crisis, uh, so people can understand that uh, climate change is a threat to public health. So in our workshops, folks don't just walk away with resources, but they also walk away with knowledge on, oh, if, I'm, if my body is experiencing uh, these symptoms, then I must be experiencing a heat, I must be suffering from heat exhaustion and I need to get this treated right away. Um, so for us, we, 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 we connect the two because uh, we understand and recognize that there's a lot of things going on in the world, particularly in underserved communities. Extreme, uh, extreme heat and, and climate change is not at the forefront. Uh, racial justice is at the forefront. You know, economic justice is at the forefront. Being racially, not being racially profiled is at the forefront. And for some, you know, just going, just, you know, going day to day uh, is at the forefront. And some are, rub, are struggling to rub two nickels together. So we're very cognizant of that. And we try to be aware and wrap it in such a way where, you know, the experiences of the, of extreme weather is not happening 50 years from now. You know, this is why it's happening. You know, the last six years have been some of the hottest 
temperature on human history in human history. So, um, yeah. So we so for us, we 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 tie it all in together. We we tie public health uh, and climate change and uh, and 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 and, and, and social resilience. You know, I didn't mention this, but people can go and check out this on our website. We also publish research with some faculty at Tufts around social connections and extreme weather. Um, and it is on the United Nations website, but I'll put a pin there. I, uh, but I, I, I would hope that answers that question from our perspective. Yeah, if I can add to that, that's excellent work, Vernon. I think from my perspective, these epidemiologic studies have been very population-based, larger scale, which is great for kind of generating hypotheses and figuring out that there's high-risk communities, but it doesn't matter if we're thinking about heat or wildfire, air pollution, COVID, or even these cumulative impacts. The populations at risk, we've already identified them. And the type of work that Vernon is doing is exactly what we need. Community level interventions, um, because if we can work from kind of like the inside out, that's what we need at this point. Um, we've already done enough of identifying vulnerable populations. We know who they are, we know where they live, um, and it's time to um, kind of take action for those particular communities. Yeah, and, and I'll add like, you know, exactly the point that everyone's making here that um, usually extreme heat, at least the way that I talk about it, I say, if you're having an issue with extreme heat, you're probably having an issue with a bunch of other things too. Um, and really a lot of the solutions that we push forward are trying to address, you know, a multiple hardship issue, you know, problem that, that we're talking about. And so um, air pollution is probably the biggest thing that we usually connect with extreme heat, um, as well as the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, we talk about how air quality triggers as, you know, air quality issues is triggering people's asthma um, for Harlem and um, the areas around it. There's really high rates of, of childhood and adult asthma. And so it helps to kind of talk about it that way of like, yeah, you know, really hot days can kind of trap air pollution in, in ways that can be really harmful. Um, you know, try to kind of talk about it in, in ways where they're very connected as well as, you know, for trying to ultimately reduce our emissions um, um, from buildings, which is New York City's biggest problem for greenhouse gas emissions, then actually making homes more sustainable, um, making homes more energy efficient is not only good for extreme heat um, protection, as well as reducing air um, quality issues inside the home, but also is helpful for climate change. So that's like one example of the way that we talk about multiple kind of big issues all at once. Yeah, thanks. And, and just to briefly add, and I know we've got a very uh, dynamic uh, uh, polling uh, happening here. You know, I would argue for um, yeah, the folks who are on this call that the heat champions that are out there, I think our work is in part to ensure that heat is in the conversation when there's an opportunity to talk about cumulative and combined exposures when we read hazard mitigation plans across the country, the level of detail for heat is very scarce relative to other hazards. So I think I think we need to keep working to get heat in the conversation when there is an opportunity to think about uh, co-benefits or at least avoiding contradictory, uh, you know, mutually harmful strategies. Thank you for all of that. And I think really you brought into the, the human experience um, into this and these narratives that wave in weave weave in and out um we are very tight on time but i really want to ask the the highest greatest rated um uh question there which is how is california balancing the need for air conditioning so increasing energy use po possible reliance on fossil fuel with reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the state and so that's related to to california but also i think you know is really a question um that's a broader question right that people bring up a lot does anyone have any thoughts on this? I can start because California was mentioned. Um, I think for California specifically, it's a little bit different in that Northern California, especially in coastal areas, many of the homes don't have air conditioners. Air conditioner use is often a marker of socioeconomic status, but it's kind of a paradox here in that some of these coastal homes that are 
very um, expensive, um, these areas um, don't have air conditioners. And that's just because in the past, we haven't needed them. Now I, I see that there are, is a big um, initiative to increase air conditioning um, use. Um, and of course that puts potential problems on the grid, right? So the electrical grid um, between uh, electrical car, electric cars, which of course we definitely need to decrease emissions, but we have to think about some of the implications for um, increasing electric use and putting more um, generating more um, issues um, in other ways. Um, and I know that that's often the kind of end all be all, like let's just put air conditioners in every house. But even in some of the epidemiologic studies we've seen is that with air conditioning use, there's still health impacts. So that's not really going to kind of be a cure all, um, particularly in certain communities um, and uh, for vulnerable subgroups in those communities, it's not going to be that helpful um, to kind of mitigate all health impacts. Yeah, and I can I can just quickly add that I think, you know, the important piece to this is that I remind folks is like air conditioner is very much like an emergency response to an emergency situation where people need to not be hospitalized or die prematurely because they didn't have cooling in their homes. Um, but then the bigger picture is how are we like mitigating and adapting to climate change? Um, and so in New York, there's a lot of work going on about um, how are we electrifying everything, which comes at a different cost and is a different conversation for us to have at another time. But, you know, how are we moving away from fossil fuels as our source um, is, you know, a parallel process that's going on. How are we putting in more sustainable cooling systems in people's home is also a parallel process. So I think it's, it's also, you know, sort of like, what's the short term thing that we're doing to immediately protect people? And then what's like the longer term goals that we have um, when it comes to cooling in homes? Okay. I, actually, I absolutely agree with what uh, some, several of our co-panelists have said. Uh, I think we would definitely love to get heat cooling pumps. We just haven't found the funding. Uh, so I think while AC units do help provide indoor cooling. Uh, I think cooling pumps, which would be zero carbon emitting would be ideal. They just cost a whole lot more. Um, and I think for us, you know, especially as a nonprofit, uh, I think we, uh, you know, would certainly be happy to give out cooling, cooling uh, to help people and uh, provide an insta, uh, well, help people connect to, to cooling, cooling uh, pumps and also heat pumps too. Uh, we just haven't found the appropriate level of funding that would allow us to do so. Uh, but I think is that would be the ideal situation where there's zero, zero carbon emitting emit, emission happening, uh, because even though any ACs are energy efficient and the ones leaving them out, they still do emit a level of, of carbon. Well, thank you, everyone. Um... Thank you also for bringing in the conversation of mitigation and climate change. Sometimes I feel like as we talk about adaptation, it gets sort of moved off the agenda and it's almost like telling people to just go smoke outside without actually, you know, talk, tackling sort of the bigger public health emergency that's underlying. So thank you very much. So I think we, um, we're going to move on now to the, yes. Okay. I'm getting a nod. Good. Um, uh, the shared story section. Thank you all for your expertise. Um, so I'm going to pass this over to Sabrina. Okay, got unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to that panel and to Anna for that really, really excellent and, and um, multi-perspective dialogue um, and for stage setting our, our whole workshop with some very important questions, some very important insights and um, really getting us going for today. Um, really wonderful and thank you so very much to Echo Anna's thank you. Um, so the, this panel, which I have the great pleasure of moderating, is really focusing on the way that I think human beings understand information, which is through stories. Um, we have three people who are going to share stories from different perspectives. 
uh, first, healthcare workers, second, communities of color, and third, worker protections. Um, the goal is to really highlight various shared experiences through these different stories, which are going to be in different locations, uh, affecting different communities, working with governments and various stakeholders in different ways. And so we're going to hear a lot of different factors in these story, a lot of different elements that play out in the context of exposure to heat, um, extreme heat. And we're gonna have some time as we did in the last panel for uh, questions at the end. Each of our, our speakers on this panel are gonna speak for about seven minutes. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our first storyteller, Cecilia Sorensen. She's the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education and associate professor of emergency medicine and environmental health sciences at Columbia University. She is going to be sharing with us stories of extreme heat and clinical practice. And just as a reminder, as I introduce people, um, I'm not going to be sharing their extensive bios. Those bios are available on the website and um, should be in the chat right now. So with that, I will turn it over to Cecilia. We can see your slides. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Great, thank you so much, Sabrina, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. So I'm going to share my perspective as an emergency medicine physician, and I hope that the stories I share will be really sort of a snapshot um, and a window into what we're seeing um, on the front lines of healthcare as it relates to um, extreme heat. So I'm going to present two case studies, uh, a little bit sort of in a medical style, um, but follow along and I'll try to use sort of um, lay terms to keep everyone together here. So the first case is of a 76 year old male who had a history of, of a cardiac arrhythmia. He has a history of hypertension. He takes multiple medications that are unknown to him. He just knows that he takes them, the red one, the green one, the blue one, and he is is Spanish speaking only. And he presented to my emergency department with a chief complaint. So that's why patients come to the ER of feeling lightheaded and then passing out. He was brought to the ER by his family after he was found collapsed in the backyard. When I was uh, went to his bedside, he was awake, he was alert. And his vital signs are, as you can see here, his, his heart rate was elevated, as was his blood pressure, and his body temperature was elevated above what we would deem to be normal. The second case I want to share with you is that of a 36-year-old male who is previously healthy. He presented with a, a main complaint of confusion. His story was that he had been driving an enclosed tractor all day around in summer temperatures. This was in the eastern plains of Colorado, and he was found confused at the work site. He arrived via an ambulance to the emergency department, and um, I met him at the entry to the emergency department because we had gotten a call ahead from the EMS that they were concerned about this patient. Um, in general, he was ill appearing. He was difficult to arouse, but he was arousable by voice. His skin was very dry. His vital signs, he had a very elevated heart rate and he had a little bit of a low blood pressure and his temperature was 103.3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very elevated. So this is what he ended up looking like after we sort of instituted um, rapid cooling measures. And I'll talk a little bit about the treatment of each of these patients, but I wanna sort of give you a little bit of an overview here of how we're thinking about sort of the clinical spectrum of heat related illnesses. Um, the first patient I presented, we would have sort of diagnosed him with heat exhaustion, right? Um, his core body temperature was not severely elevated. Um, he did not have any neurologic dysfunction. He was not confused. He was not disoriented. Um, his core body temperature was a little bit elevated. He felt lightheaded he did pass out. This is in contrast to heat stroke, which is a life-threatening situation where your core body temperature is severely elevated and you do have some neurologic dysfunction. Now, heat exhaustion can progress to heat stroke, but oftentimes when we're looking at specifically heat-related deaths, we're looking at people who die of heat stroke. So when we're sort of looking at patients who come into the emergency department, from a clinical perspective, each has a very unique constellation of risks or vulnerabilities, um, which help us so quote, explain why they ended up um, being diagnosed with a heat-related illness. And so I, we classify these as, you know, what was their exposure? 
what was their sensitivity and what was their adaptive capacity that made it so they were perhaps unable to, to cope with the extreme heat that they were experiencing. So just to show these an example, let's look at case one, a little bit of an analysis here. So just to set the context, this was um, during the summer, there were higher than average temperatures, but this was not a heat alert type of situation. It was just a hot summer day. This was an elderly male. He had a history of a cardiac condition. He was on multiple medications and he was Spanish speaking only. The patient also did not suspect he was vulnerable. I spoke with him, he was born and raised in Central America. And and when I revealed to him that I think he was here at the emergency department today because of heat related illness, he said he was shocked. He said, I grew up in the heat. I know heat. You know, I was drinking water all day. I, 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 he almost didn't believe me. And, you know, what you have to explain is that the heat that we're experiencing today is like nothing that we've ever experienced in the past. And so sort of reframing that and helping patients who don't consider themselves to be vulnerable to understand that this heat we're seeing is like nothing we've ever seen before. He also had no air conditioning in his home. So we obviously need to get uh, the reverend to this neighborhood um, quickly to sort of get things in order. Thinking about his, his pre-hospital situation, you know, his family did see him that day. He was complaining of feeling lightheaded. You know, his family sort of reported, well, we weren't really sure what was going on. We thought maybe it had to do with his medications. So we were telling him to drink water, but they were not really attuned to the early signs and symptoms of a heat-related illness. And so there was kind of a lack of family awareness and community awareness as to the signs and symptoms of heat-related illness. Now, when he got to our facility, um, we had no chilled fluids. We don't have refrigerated fluids. We just don't have them. And then when we're thinking about how, you know, once we stabilize this patient and he's ready to go home, how do we make sure that he's not going back to the same environment that caused him to get sick, right? We need, we need a social worker. We need case management to be able to help doing a home assessment to help further educate the family and educate the patient as to things they can do within the house to make this patient safe. I also had no ability to communicate with his medication prescribers, for example, his PCP and his cardiologist. We have massive issues in the United States with different um, electronic health records. Um, he couldn't tell me the name of the doctors. Um, he didn't have the pill bottles. You know, how much time can I spend tracking down his cardiologist and being like, hey, your patient who you have on a diuretic came in after he passed out. We need you to adjust this medication, right? So I had no way of communicating. So these are some of the barriers that we're facing when we're trying to um, address the health um, harms to patients who really have kind of, I would say, fallen through the cracks of public health um, prevention measures that happen in our communities. The second case, you know, again, this was higher than average temperatures, but this was not a heat um, a heat wave, right? And so what we're learning more and more is that heat injury often happens on the shoulders of heat waves. Um, it also happens during them, but when people are not getting alerted, they can still get injured. Um, there's a big question mark here as to whether or not there were any workplace precautions in place, and we're going to talk about that later on today. Again, this was a 36-year-old male. He didn't think he was vulnerable to heat. And he did end up having a positive um, urine drug screen for methamphetamines. So he was using substances while on the job in the heat. So another issue, but that did contribute to his vulnerability. Um, Pre-hospital, he was picked up by an EMS crew. Um, no temperature was taken in the field. Um, this is a big issue and no cooling was started in the field. We know that heat stroke is an incredibly time sensitive condition. We have to lower their core body temperature in 30 minutes or less to prevent organ damage. We need our EMS crews to have ability in ambulances to cool patients and they need to be aware of protocols and they need to be able to diagnose this in the field, right? Because it took 20 minutes during transport for him to get to the ER. Like this is precious time, right? Again, his coworkers had no idea what was wrong with this guy. They're like, I think he was partying last night. We don't know, right? So really no, no workplace awareness or precautions um, around the signs and symptoms of heat stroke. Now, when he got to our emergency facility, I mean, this is a little bit embarrassing for me to report, but we had no ability to do cold water immersion, which is when you immerse a patient in a bathtub of ice slurry, okay? Um, we rapidly exhausted our ice machine. We had our security guard go across the street um, to get ice from the gas station. We had no ability to monitor his core temperature. We called up the ICU three or four times trying to get a core temperature monitor. Um, and overall, our staff didn't really have experience. You know, we don't have, we didn't have protocols in place. I was like, we need to pack this patient in ice and cold water. I need a fan. And people are looking at me like I'm crazy. I mean, this is not my patient in this picture, but like, this is kind of intense. We don't do this every day in the ER. Okay. So a little bit of a breakdown there. Now, if we take these sort of, um, in this little microcosms of my, my day in a life, and we blow them up to something like the Pacific Northwest heat wave, which happened in 2021, right? This was a historically unprecedented extreme heat event, near surface air temperature, 
temperature anomalies were up to 20 degrees Celsius above normal over a very wide range of the Pacific Northwest into Canada. There was a rel relatively short advanced warning, and this region had very little lived experience with heat. They were also acute on chronic capacity constraints. This is a population area that's growing faster than healthcare capacity. And this was during COVID, right? So you can imagine this was like, you know, what we're talking about climate change and compounding disasters. Here we go, right? So what ended up happening was that there was a 100 fold increase in heat related ED visits. And this is just looking at HHS region 10. This is data from the CDC. And, you know, 100 fold increase is a lot, right? It's a lot for an emergency department to manage one critically sick heat patient. Now imagine there's 20 or 30 or 40 and they're not stopping, right? Okay, so this is this is a lot, a lot going on. When we did it, when, uh, not we, when an analysis was done looking at who was vulnerable during this heat wave, it was found, not surprisingly, that community deaths were higher in neighborhoods with material and social deprivation and lower levels of green space, okay? We also know that mental illness and substance use disorders were significant risk factors for patients and that the risk was highest among those aged 65 to 85 years old and among females, okay? Um, data from Nature, figure from New York Times. So what ended up happening on the ground? And this is all anecdotal evidence that, that I've gathered and, and gotten from various sources. So first of all, 911 call centers were overwhelmed. We know that with extreme heat, we have impacts um, on health directly. We also know that there's a rise in, um, in accidental and non-accidental trauma. We know that there's more homicides, more assaults, more issues of domestic violence. Like, Things go haywire, right? So 911 call centers were overwhelmed. We had massive surges of patients in regional hospitals. Meanwhile, several facilities lost power, okay? There was no regional disaster plans in place for heat waves. So what I heard anecdotally, what happened is that they triggered the only disaster plan they had for the region, which was specific to respond to earthquakes. They thought that was going to be the biggest thing that was going to hit the region. So they activated the earthquake response plan, which was good because it got everybody talking to each other, all the right people, the EMS, the different hospital systems. It kind of worked. But again, we had no plans in place for heat. Hospitals quickly ran out of ice, you know, and, uh, and abilities to cool patients. And so this ingenious idea kind of spread virally throughout the region. Um, doctors went to the morgues and they got body bags because these are... Um, they're waterproof and you can fill them with ice and water and you can submerge patients. Um, this is how many patients there were guys. So it was, it was a really intense situation. And um, this was a, a sort of very much a, an ER, you know, duct tape fixed to a situation at the time. Ventilators were in short supply because again, this was COVID. So after this heat wave, you know, the Pacific Northwest really had this, you know, this never again moment, like we will never let this happen again. That was horrible. And so what did they do? They created heat action plans in affected cities. They started having closer coordination of EMS and healthcare systems um, with meteorologic services, right? Can you guys give us a little more warning, right? Like, tell us what you know, right? There has been more engagement of communities most impacted by heat and environmental injustice, including seniors. Um, caregivers for children, communities of color um, to improve extreme heat plans and response. There's been greater outreach to homeless and mental health populations and healthcare systems have done upgrades. So they're not going to be caught off guard again. So this is good. So when this happened in the Pacific Northwest, maybe we would think, wow, you know, if you're sitting in a city in Montana, you might be like, whoa, we better start getting it together because this could happen here. That that didn't really happen, right? We seem to have this barrier as humans whereby unless it happens directly to us, we don't think it will ever happen to us, right? And so we're, we're stuck in this situation, but the Pacific Northwest is ready. So, um, so thinking about sort of the healthcare system challenges. So there's clinical challenges, right? Um, treatment of heat stress and, and saving a life from heat requires, first of all, recognition, and second of all, administration of care right, of the right care at the right time. And that requires trained staff, right? And that ranges from the paramedics to the person sitting at the front desk in the emergency department who's taking a triage complaint to the nurses caring for the patients to the doctors, right? And these folks have not been systematically trained. Um, we know that widespread access to cooling resources is limited, right? We're using body bags. Um, 
And we know that a whole of healthcare system approach is really needed, right? We need social workers on board. We need case managers. We need our pharmacists, right? Who are sitting in CVS drugstores around the country dispensing diuretics during a heat wave to warn patients that this is gonna make you dehydrated and there's a heat wave, right? We also are suffering from a lack of research to guide evidence-based practices. So for example, we don't know what we should be doing to cool pregnant patients who come in with heat-related illnesses. We have no idea, we have no studies, we're using our best guess. So we need more research to improve our practices. We also know we have health care system challenges, right? So there has not been widespread adoption of triage and treatment protocols for heat-related illnesses, right? Heat-related illnesses are incredibly time-sensitive, similar to a cerebral stroke or to sepsis, where we've had massive um, national improvements and in indicators because we have treatment protocols. We haven't done this for heat. There hasn't been that push. Um, we also have no mandate to require heat or other climate-related events to be part of a facility's hazard vulnerability assessment. All healthcare facilities have to do hazard vulnerability assessments. There is no mandate to require heat or any other climate-related risks there. Um, really, we no, also, sorry to interrupt, but do you, is this your last slide? That's it. Okay, wonderful. I will let you finish. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry. Um, anyway, we also have community challenges, um, lack of patient and community awareness, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I'll just wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cecilia. That was uh, incredibly compelling and very, very important work that you did in that context and sharing that with us. So thank you so very much for that story. I am very happy to introduce our next speaker um, storyteller. Zalalem um, will be, it, she is um, the, sorry, I've lost my, Zillalem Adafris is the CEO of Catalyst Miami, and she is going to be speaking us today to us today about her experience working with communities of color in the context of exposure to extreme heat, which is we've already heard so far today is an incredibly important um, area of work. And with that, Zillalem, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I don't have slides, but I hope this story is engaging in and of itself. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Zalala Medefris. I'm the CEO of a nonprofit organization here in Miami-Dade County, Florida called Catalyst Miami. Um, at, at Catalyst Miami, we're a grassroots power building organization uh, and we focus on issues of social and economic justice um, here in Miami-Dade County, uh, including climate justice, which uh, I came on to staff seven years ago now to build out their climate justice programming. So this is a seven year long story condensed into five to eight minutes <laughs> on our work specific to, to heat. Um, so basically um, when, I, when I came on staff seven years ago, my primary job was to create um, grassroots leadership training programs. So these are free programs that we offer to community members. Uh, to build up their leadership and advocacy skills. So I was asked to create a curriculum um, on climate justice in particular. Uh, and so that program is called CLEAR. It stands for Community Leadership on the Environment, Advocacy and Resilience. Um, and it's a 10 week program uh, where um, uh, community members learn about the specific climate threats facing Miami-Dade County, uh, what are potential solutions, and then they build up their advocacy skills, um, such as um, telling a personal story, how to speak to elected officials about these issues, as well as how to uh, speak to your neighbors and, and bring other people on. And I'm, I'm so happy to say, since this program launched in the fall of 2016, we have well over 500 graduates, um, and we've replicated the program uh, to have a health justice program and a housing justice program. But anyways, um, the, the program, like I said, talks about different climate impacts for Miami. So we talk about sea level rise and flooding um, and hurricanes. Um, and we have another section on climate and health where we go through all the ways climate impacts your health from mental health to extreme heat. Uh, and basically, when we go through that section of the curriculum, our community members, by the way, this program is free. It, um, we have youth programming as well. So parents learn alongside their children who have like a similar uh, 
program in the room next door. Um, and, and we also provide uh, interpretation and free transportation, everything to reduce the barriers to get people to participate so we can um, learn from their wisdom. Um, but anyways, um, they, out of all the issues that we talked about and all the challenges, um, people really said they felt um, the, the heat issue the most. And in particular, the statistic that we showed was that since 1972, be between 1972 and 2018, Miami has added about 70 days over 90 degrees. So that's about two more months of summer um, in an already quite hot place. Um, and so when we asked people in the room, like how many of you have, have noticed this as longtime residents of Miami-Dade County, everyone that had been here for long enough was like, yeah, definitely. I felt like two more months of summer from, uh, you know, back in the seventies or eighties when I was growing up here um, or when I first moved here. Um, so for us, like a huge important part of this program is that those community members inform our policy and advocacy work as an organization, as well as help us define future programs that we, that we create, um, as well as direct services. We do direct services as well. Um, and so when we're hearing over and over that heat, extreme heat is something people are feeling whether they're an outdoor worker or they're just waiting for a, the bus stop uh, at, for the bus, and our we have a perpetually late public transportation system that you know has unshaded bus stops everywhere uh, throughout the county. Um, that like clearly this was a big issue that we needed to work on, uh, and so we approached our county to work on this issue. We told them like all about the stories that our community members. Um, and uh, that we're sharing with us as well as the statistics. Uh, and then they told us like they had they had gone and looked this up. And unfortunately, the health department does not gather data on climate and, uh, and heat, uh, heat and health, sorry. Uh, and so this program, this problem that we're describing doesn't exist. Like that's, that's what we were told. There's no data, so it doesn't exist despite what all of these residents of our county are saying and, and their personal experiences. Uh, and so at that point, um, clearly we know this is an issue. Um, and so we were tasked with gathering the data ourselves. Um, we, our local university, Florida International University, was doing citizen science days on sea level rise at the time. Um, and at the time, sea level rise was the big climate issue that our counties and cities wanted to work on. Um, but it's not the top issue for the communities that we work with, it's low and middle income communities who are more facing, um, you know, challenges paying for your electric bill, uh, having jobs where they work outdoors. And so, you know, heat was the biggest thing they're facing rather than flooding. Uh, and so we worked with our local university to um, uh, take that sea level rise citizen science initiative um, and apply it to heat. So we launched our shading date initiative, which was our heat citizen science initiative. Uh, we had very little funding. We actually had none. I don't know how FIU pulled this together, but, but they uh, created some sensors that took heat and humidity. And we worked with our community members to place them in the locations that, that, uh, that they were spending time in, whether it was a park or a bus stop. Um, and in our pilot, what we found was that our readings were up to 30 degrees different than what we got on the weather service. Um, and that when we asked the weather service why that was, uh, it was because their sensor was at the airport. It was like several feet uh, above the ground, I think like 10 to 10 to 20 feet above the ground, which is totally different than being sitting down at a bus stop or in a park and experiencing the urban heat island effect, right? So we had a massive discrepancy. Um, and so over the years, that was in 2018, uh, we continued to present that data, grow that program. Um, and we uh, uh, like kept pushing and kept bringing it up that we need to address it. Um, and I think we've been successful on, on several fronts. Um, first, um, uh, that continued pressing of the message that our that our community members have brought up, that we continued to gather data to substantiate, um, uh, got recognized and picked up by media, national media. Um, and then there was an opportunity with a change of leadership in Miami-Dade County to really take the lead on, the, on this initiative. So Miami-Dade County actually appointed the world's first chief heat officer specifically tasked to address issues of extreme heat. 
Um, and that was a very controversial position to get funded. Um, and so our community members uh, participated in the county budget hearings to uh, explain exactly why, <laughs> like why we need this position. Um, we got our research published recently. I think it'll be in the upcoming Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. Um, uh, and as a result of that, the Web National Weather Service has changed its heat warning system locally because previously, I think Miami had more winter storm warnings than it did heat <laughs> over the decades uh, because each uh, local National Weather Service office is in charge of defining what uh, heat you know, what a heat event is. Um, so we got them to drop their thresholds to be much more similar to um, what people are experiencing on the ground today. Um, and we actually had a heat warning last week. It was extremely hot last week here. Um, so it was really cool to see that on the news as something notable here in Miami-Dade County and for people to get adequate warnings. Um, and then lastly, we are working with our chief heat officer, um, or we had worked with her um, to create an extreme heat action plan. We actually um, uh, worked with her to develop the process to create that plan. Uh, and so a part of that was having open meetings to the community to give feedback on each of the elements, including housing and workforce. Um, and so they had about 50 people in every single meeting they had, which I think were five or six um, uh, in the specific sections of the plan. And so we, we have a plan that's really community informed and driven that we can implement now, um, uh, you know, as we move forward to really provide material relief to, to folks here in the county. So I think I may be out of time, but that's my story for now. And I, I hope um, I hope to stay connected with you all. Thank you so much. That Wow. I mean, I'm so impressed by the success that you've had. And I mean, little did I understand that we have a historic, historic case study that you've brought to us here. Um, so congratulations and thank you so much for sharing that and inspiring the rest of us. Um, I would like to move on to our next storyteller, Jora Trang, who's the Chief of Staff and Equity at WorkSafe. Um, she is going to be speaking us speak to speaking to us today about um, indoor and outdoor worker protections and health, which obviously we are already hearing um, even so far what an important area of work this is. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Jora. Um, and do you have slides or are you? I do, and I don't see my share slide function here. I don't see it yet either. Are we having a technical issue? Do we need any help? Please make me the co-host. <laughs> uh... Can we make Jora a co-host so that she can share her slides? Are you, is it not allowing you to share your slides? Yeah, I don't have any ability to share my slides. Okay, but so we need to make you a co-host. If you all have my slides, you can share my slides, but I can start. Um, I am going to talk today about um, workers in the California region and the work that WorkSafe has done to um, ensure that they are protected. And I'm still looking for my little thing to show. Ah, here it is. Yay. Great. I, I know you all were saying we don't have time for any... <laughs> Thank Wonderful. You. We can see your slides and we can hear you now. Thank Great. you. Okay, warehouse workers, let's get into it. Um, I'm Jora. I work at WorkSafe. We are the intersection of uh, policy advocacy, worker outreach, and movement building. And I want to start my story with Maria Isabel Vasquez Jimenez. Um, she was um, the instigator. Unfortunately, um, what happened to her was the instigator for um, our outdoor heat standard. So we are. Um, a state plan um, state, which means that we have our own um, California state plan to um, govern the health and safety of workers. I think um, other states might have Fed OSHA, we have Cal OSHA. Um, in, I believe it was 2008, Maria uh, was pregnant and she was out pruning grapes um, at the Merced farm and she had worked for nine hours straight. Um, her body um, temperature reached 108 and she unfortunately collapsed and died of heat stroke within two days. This uh, prompted an outrage that along with the death of 13 other workers in 2005 earlier, but as a general um, rule, and I'm not even talking about extreme heat, I'm just talking about heat. So in an extreme heat situation, it's even worse. Um, there were um, 
there's been a, a, a many, many deaths every year. Um, and it, it prompted uh, us to fight for um, the outdoor heat standard. So when I say us, I don't mean work safe, just work safe. I mean, workers, worker leaders, work safe, and all uh, a whole uh, uh, cadre of organizations that work in solidarity in California, uh, labor organizations, community organizations to fight for laws that protect workers. Um, in particular, I'd like to highlight California Rural Legal Assistance, which is um, uh, works a lot in the rural area. They um, have been able, as a result of all this advocacy uh, have a direct relationship with Cal OSHA so that they can identify any kind of outdoor heat situations and and kind of like uh, initiate uh, Cal OSHA to come out earlier. So our first uh, the outdoor heat standard that we worked on became the first in the country and applies to all outdoor places of employment. This is really critical because it gives Cal OSHA a tool to go out and and cite people or, or inspect people. If there is not a standard for an issue, it's very difficult for uh, Cal OSHA, which is our enforcement agency, to go out and be able to cite. Instead, they have to rely on the what we call the injury and illness prevention plan, which is more of a general, um, general uh, plan, uh, kind of a general duty clause. Um, so, so let me. I'm about to tell you how that was challenging. So, my story really starts with Warehouse Workers Resource Center and a collaborative that I. Um, that WorkSafe had with uh, Warehouse, uh, with WWRC to try to um, raise the awareness of workers at Walmart, uh, at Walmart um, primarily Walmart, but mostly many retail warehousing um, uh, facilities out in the Inland Empire, which is kind of like Riverside, San Bernardino County. There are many, many warehouses out there. And as you know, now Amazon has become really a, a, a central place for how people shop and, and buy things. Warehousing has become a huge industry and, and the movement and distribution of uh, goods through warehousing is, is a huge part of our, um, our economy now. So my story starts with Domingo Blancas, who was a um, warehouse worker and Domingo's, I like to announce is, is well and, and alive um, and living in his home country. Um, and probably not even knowing how instrumental he's been <laughs> in this country. But Domingo was a, a warehouse worker and he worked in one of those metallic canisters, you know, the sh that you often see in the shipping yards. They're huge, probably, you know, ginormous, and they carry goods that come off of, uh, from a boat. They get into a port and they sit there and then they go into a where they get transported to a warehouse. Um, on the day that uh, Domingo Blanca's uh, collapse, it was about maybe 100 100 to 105 degrees outside. Um, but he was working inside one of these metallic um, canisters and his job was to like sweep and, and helped um, move the materials out. At the same time that he was working, there was a forklift in there. So if you can imagine it's 100 and to 105 outside, inside the metallic canister, it's almost like being cooked. It was like 110 or more. Domingo um, Blancas and other people were, are, are under a quota. They have to work, get a, a certain amount of stuff moving and ready. Um, and they have like a, a limited amount of time to do that. They also have breaks which they, uh, in which they can go get water and use the bathroom. But the distance between where they are and where the bathroom is or where the water is or where the water cooler is, um, is longer than 10 minutes. So it's not within a 10 minute stretch, which is the amount of time of the break. And Domingo's reported to me that he um, was unable to stop to drink water. There's no water available. And also he just couldn't get to the water cooler. And when he did get to the water cooler, this is what he was given to drink the water. I don't know if I can just pause for a second for you to understand what this is. There's a hole at the end of this. This is a piece of paper not even cups were available to, to workers. And so you had just like a, an extreme situation, you know, employers often say, well, why do you have to mandate this? Why do you have to mandate that? Because you don't even provide cups. If I don't mandate you to provide cups and water and a place to cool down, you won't. And so that's why WorkSafe fights for what we fight for. Um, so long story short, Domingo Blanco, uh, a collapse um, from heat, uh, from heat stroke is what argue, our argument was. Um, he went to his employer and said, um, or he couldn't go to his employer, he was just faint. And, and um, somebody reported that he was not doing well. Um, the employer um, ignored him. 
he then went to uh, uh, he he then tried to go up because it was one of those um, warehouses where you have a staffing agency in the interim in the middle. Um, so he went higher up to the warehouse owner and they kind of ignored him and everyone just kind of pushed them away. And so the other uh, he had to have another worker drive him to the hospital. The other worker, so I listened to um, the first speaker, Cecilia's presentation. I would say that Domingo Blanca's was maybe um, similar to the 76-year-old patient and the worker who drove him was similar to the 30-year-old patient in that they were both suffering from some kind of heat situation. They both drove themselves to the hospital. Domingo Blanca's ended up being hospitalized for three days and luckily came out alive, but not well. You know, still suffers um, to this day from um, that situation. So what happened as a result of this is that this case went to trial or an appeal um, because we had Cal OSHA, oh, Cal OSHA came out because there was an accident. They did a, um, an investigation, they cited, and because there was no standard for indoor heat, so this constitutes indoor heat because it's inside a canister as opposed to outdoor heat, um, this went to appeal and the employer um, hired a very expensive uh, law firm, uh, employer defense law firm to fight it and went all the way up to the state court. And I'm just kind of emphasizing that because that's very unusual, you know, for somebody to fight a case all the way up to um, the state court. It just kind of stays within this um, uh, OSHA realm of, of appeals. Um, so we uh, represented Domingo Blancas in, in that whole journey um, and fought really hard uh, for Cal OSHA to be able to cite on this uh, situation, even though there was no indoor heat standard at the time, and we won um, that case. Uh, and then that moved into allowing us to fight for SB 1167, which is just simply a rule that says, hey, Cal OSHA, can you please issue um, an indoor heat standard? So that deadline had a 2019 deadline, COVID hit, and we've just kind of been delayed. We're still working on this. It's now 2023. So it takes a very long time, unfortunately, for these things to kind of come to fruition. Um, and everything that uh, Reverend Vernon Walker talked about in terms of community building um, kind of stands true for me too. We, in order to build the, the case for this, we went out into the communities, we taught. This is a picture of me and, um, and two of my colleagues, you know, trying to like inspire people to learn about in, indoor heat or heat and how it affects your body. These two, uh, people, participants uh, won awards <laughs> for the amount of information they were able to uh, regurgitate back to me. Um, again, as I was saying, this is really a community effort. All these organizations participated in this. It's really our entire success story, not just WorkSafe. Um, and the pictures here, uh, in particular, I want to point out that we got workers out. You know, it's really so important to get workers out to testify what they're actually experiencing for the policymakers and lawmakers to hear from the workers' experience, because the workers are the experts um, in what they uh, in in explaining the work um, environment. So that is the end of my story. I hope um, I've made an impact, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Jora. <laughs> just another incredible story. I just I'm so floored by by you, Jora, by our three speakers and uh, incredible, incredible work. Um, I, we're going to take the next 15 minutes or so to discuss um, these three speakers. And please, uh, for those of you participating, please add your questions to the Slido. And we are picking up the questions that are getting the most, um, I don't know if they're votes or or. or at the rising to the top. Um, but I, before I pick some questions from Slido, I, each one of you has worked in such a different context and with such different um, stakeholders, communities, et cetera. I wonder if I could just start by asking you uh, on starting out on more of a difficult note, like what has been the primary obstacles to being effective in creating heat resilience in, in each of your contexts? And, and just so you have in the back of your mind, I next, and feel free to combine these answers if you'd like. I, then I want to hear what has been most critically empowering for you, what has been most effective, what, and you know, what do we want to create more of in, in your context? So in any particular order, whoever, whoever would like to go first. Um, I'm going to uh, take sips of coffee from my little cup here as I talk. <laughs> I, for us, it's been employer opposition um, and the political will to pass something. Um, the, the, 
there uh, is, are a lot of challenges from our chamber of commerce, but there's also supportive employers. There's also employers who are out there who want to make sure that they have the right environment. But, but there's some economic issues involved with, for example, running a warehouse. Like, like employers feel like they have to close the doors to prevent theft. You know, they they don't have an AC system for the entire warehouse. Now that may be different now. But that's I'm just talking about my the case that I I had in 2011. You know. Um, warehousing may be different uh, today but it's been employer opposition every time we come out to do these um to uh, fight for these laws employers come out and they they also talk about how it's feasible whether it's practical can they do this can they do that and and so we have kind of like discussions negotiating back and forth to figure out that sweet spot where we can empower employers to do what they uh, need to do to prevent uh, worker injury illness and and also at the same time ensure that workers are safe I can jump in. I think that, you know, with heat, it seems like my perception of it is that, you know, when it's really, really hot out, everyone says, oh, shoot, it's 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 a problem. Right. But we don't think about it ahead of time. And so we're, we're really lacking in in the preparedness of this. Right. And I think the case of, you know, Pacific Northwest heat wave is 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 perfect. Right. It's, you know, a place that's completely unexpected this to happen and it's taken off guard. Right. And I think at this point, I mean, no, no place in the U.S. should be taken off guard by the risks of climate change. Right. We have really, really good projections for everywhere in the U.S. And so the biggest barrier is that, you know, different um, I'm not going to put blame. We're not taking precautions across the board, right, to be able to respond to these. And so the question is, you know, how do we bridge this gap? How can we be better communicators about this and put forth options um, that that make sense for different communities? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I would also agree with political will being, a, and also just. I think sometimes government uh, has so many regulations that they trip themselves up. Like, for example, street trees. Let's say we want to put a tree over a bus stop. Probably impossible. Trees can't go near the street. Trees can't go near a sidewalk. Trees can't go near a building. That's all like zoning, zoning codes that make something, uh, you know, or, you know, the tree roots might tear up some of the concrete. So, and then a neighbor might get charged because that tree was in front of their property. And so people don't want that either. They don't want to be like, so, you know, um, I think there are, there are certain solutions that we're, um, uh, we've kind of like tripped ourselves up on and regulatory tape in order to, um, you know, to, to effectively, um, to put forth. Um, so yeah, I think like for us, like it's that, and then like a lack of, you know, there's been inequitable investments across this entire country, no matter where you are. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, like uh, I'm representing communities of color, but all of Miami-Dade County is a community of color. I think we're over 80% <laughs> communities of color. Um, and, and, you know, the as the country becomes more diverse, those inequitable investments um, don't serve um, uh, don't serve this nation, right? Um, and, and I would argue, nor have they ever. So, um, you know, I think uh, if you do a one-off, I'm just using trees in, as an example, but if if we've had many cases of like uh, one-off or multiple at attempts at planting trees in communities of color here in Miami, um, where there's then no investment in the in the um, uh, the care <laughs> and the botany and all of that. And um, that creates a lack of trust in, in communities about um, what people are putting into their neighborhoods only to see it crumble. Um, so uh, yeah, I think like those in that particular case, those are some of our, our biggest um, uh, obstacles. Can I add one more? Um, of course. I forget, and, and that is union density or the the inability of workers to to organize, come together, and strengthen their voices. There, there's such, there's so much activity um, in the last, uh, maybe forever, but in the last couple of decade, in the last decade or so, to prevent workers from uh, forming health and safety committees, um, meeting to talk about um, how to improve their workplace, and and just forming unions like. Um, the the workers that we previously organized, uh, or I should say, Warehouse Workers Resource Center organized, have all experienced some level of retaliation 
uh, directly following our lawsuit and all those uh, organizers are gone. They're just gone. And, and we have to start over again. And it, it's just a process that's cyclical. And it's really difficult for a place to ever improve their, their health and safety um, <coughs> practices. Thank you. That, all of that was very interesting and I think helpful for all of us to hear. Um, I want to pull a question that's being upvoted in the Slido, which I think actually your last comment is a nice segue into, which is, what do you all think about the best way to communicate better to whomever you think is the most relevant audience or audiences about the risks of heat, the need for resilient strategies, policy change, accountability regarding re retaliation, whatever it is you think, the, the messaging, the audiences, how can we better improve our communications? Because you guys, the three of you have been so effective in communicating, clearly it's possible. You know, some of the studies around who are the best climate communicators um, have revealed sort of, I think, two real groups that come to the forefront, one being um, religious and spiritual communities and leaders of those communities can really be powerful messengers, um, as well as healthcare practitioners. And so some of the work that I've been doing has really been around how do you train nurses, doctors, pharmacists, public health professionals to be able to incorporate a climate and heat lens into the work that they're doing? Um, because I think when you hear from your trusted primary care doctor, like, hey, it's really hot outside, you need to look after your mom, look for these signs and symptoms, people are by and large going to do it. It, right. And so I think we can really, you know, harness that that public trust that health professionals have with communities um, and, and use that voice, um, you know, for the sake of protecting the health of our of our communities we care for. I'm going to pull in the Mockley workers and that movement um, as an example. Uh, Mockley workers were tomato farm uh, workers and pickers, and they um, they they were talking about piecemeal and, and tomato picking, and, and it was a wage and hour issue. But they ultimately, it was the employers who were giving it, making it difficult because they were the ones paying a low rate. And but they ultimately created some kind of like um, um, kind of like justice justice network justice initiative, you know where were um, big um, fast food restaurants and, and, and other grocery stores were getting together and kind of uh, putting forth the, the uh, message that we all care about these workers. So it's the same in, with heat. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a community, it's an environment, it's a social issue. So I feel like we have to get the consumers the employers and the workers all kind of in the same messaging. And, but, we, but we all come from different uh, backgrounds. Like we all feel a different way about it, right? There are people among us who don't believe in climate change or climate justice. So you have to go to their values. And the values are, you know, family-based values, uh, quality of life, quality, job quality kind of messaging. So all of, you know, some messaging around all of us being, um, invested in each other. Employers in particular are concerned about profit. So um, messaging that is around healthier workers means more productivity, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, something like that, you know? So you, 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 we just have to have, and, and we have to get consumers involved. Like, you know, people often for just, they're kind of like this, this outside ring of folks, but, but consumers um, are really powerful voices because they uh, have the ability to control the market. So we, so there needs to be, you know, a, a narrative uh, shift that includes everyone around quality jobs, um, which includes better standards around heat. Absolutely. Um, and I'll just add, I think one of the most harmful messages on the back end that I've heard repeatedly, I have a public health degree, so I've heard this even in academic settings, are is that people in the South or people in the global South somehow have some genetic predisposition where we are not susceptible to extreme heat. And I, I, there's like, like uh, there's a comparison that I, that I hear a lot that, um, well, people in Miami can deal with it more than people in the Pacific Northwest. That might be a little true. That there's less AC and stuff in the Pacific Northwest, but that certainly does not serve like, the hundreds of thousands and millions of people like that that live here that suffer every single day, you know, um, or the, the outdoor workers that work outside. I think you're 
um, uh, there's an assumption uh, that because we have air conditioning, you know, in more of our buildings that like everyone living here can afford to pay for it and um, uh, doesn't have to doesn't have to be exposed to the heat, which is completely untrue. So that's like my biggest communications wish that I think um, uh, I wish we would eradicate as a field and just like accept, you know, accept that um, the body, the human body can only take so much. And, and, and these comparisons are definitely not helpful. And that was a huge thing we had to overcome. Sorry, I want to add one more thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> maybe always be the adder. Um, something you said sparked my, my, um, my thought. Um, so the whole thing about AC. You uh, some you know there's this there's a thought or understanding that if you have AC in a building, the workers who work in AC are okay. But what a lot of people don't realize is that AC gets turned off at a certain hour in order to save money. And so janitors, for example, come in and clean a building with the windows closed with no AC. So their their clothes are drenching wet. They're sticking to them. They're hot. And so it's just <laughs> just something to note that 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 worker situations are so complex and nuanced that we just really need as much information as possible in order to advocate best for workers. Thank you. That uh, I, I'm a theme that I'm detecting here is the importance of embedded or local or indigenous knowledge that helps actually increase the accuracy of any kind of resilience measures, which I, I think you're you're referring to there. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question in this session, and one that's rising to the top in the Slido. Um, is how can we make our alerts and definitions of heat risk be more useful in emergencies? And this is something that Dr. Basu uh, touched on and that Dr. Sorensen has touched on. Um, but I think, you know, that even the bigger question is each one of you are pushing the bounds of even identifying when it's a risk and raising it as a risk. And how do we do that better? How How can we be more effective um, such that we are capturing the real risk and not the imagined risk, which has really been normalized in a lot of places. Well, um, two things. One, one is that uh, well, this is from the employers, uh, the employer, the labor side. Um, we have um, instituted at the federal level and then now in California reporting requirements. Um, under the previous administration, a lot of the reporting requirements were kind of like weakened. Um, uh, and then we have reinstituted um, Obama era um, reporting. It's so important that we get report, reports from employers, electronic reports, they're supposed to submit them regularly so that we can understand what is going on in a workplace. It, it, under the last administration, the reporting kind of stopped around six months, but you need more than six months. Um, so we've reinstituted that under this uh, administration, presidential administration, and we need to be able to see how a workplace changes seasonally, you know, with every season so that workers, um, medical workers, field workers, public health workers can come in and, and recommend what needs to be put in place to prevent injury and illness. And the second thing is, at least in California, we know when wildfire hits, when it when it's hot, when it, so we need to be proactive ahead of time with, and know that hey, it's about to be fire wildfire season, it's about to be indoor heat or outdoor heat season. Let's get all these things ready three months ahead of time. You know, not 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 two weeks or whatever, not when the wildfire hits or or, or not when in, the temperatures rise to an incre incredible level. So um, really early prevention and being very well planned ahead of time. I think it's a difficult question, right? Because there's sort of like the alert fatigue, right? Well, if every other day is a heat alert day, people are eventually going to not care anymore. Um, and so maybe it's shifting. I'm not the communications expert. I'm, I'm just shooting from the hip. Maybe it's shifting to saying, well, this is heat season. Right. And all during heat season, we have different um, degrees of alert, right, ranging from low to high. Think about like when you drive into a national park, it's like fire risk today is low, moderate, high, because we also know that different uh, individuals and populations become sick at lower temperatures than others. Right. So even in a heat wave, um, we're, we're already way beyond the threshold for some people who could get sick. I think we also need to embed this into, you know, 
frontline healthcare messaging that we do on a daily basis, right? So if you're a pediatrician and you meet with a family, you ask them, are there guns in the home? Do you wear seatbelts and do you wear helmets when you ride a bike, right? Basic, basic things to ensure safety. And maybe a fourth question is, you know, do you have air conditioning in your home? And do you know what the signs and symptoms are of heat illness, right? So how do we embed this in kind of what we do every day um, as, as health providers, right? Um, we ask similar questions that when people come into the emergency department, are you safe at home, right? Are, you know, and we have these screening questions. I think we can introduce something like that around heat into our sort of common everyday practice, right? And I think that the other questions got introduced because there was large advocacy around, you know, motor vehicle deaths, around gun violence, around these things that we were just able to generate enough political will to get large medical societies to start making recommendations around this. Yeah, and I'll just share some examples going off of what Dr. Sorensen said. Um, first, uh, we do, we are experimenting with, we have a heat season in Miami-Dade County now, and I know they're experimenting with creating a ranking system like, you know, with our hurricanes, we have a category one to a category five. So something similar for extreme heat. I also think no matter where you are, your heat warning system should take into account the urban heat island effect. So if um, like I said, we had a 30 degree discrepancy. That's significant. <laughs> so like, um, bringing it down a little bit to like, um, make sure it's, it's not just for that, that one, that, those couple of spots that we're doing radar, but like uh, reflect what people on the ground are feeling, even if it's a small, like portion of the land in your County, I think is important because at the end of the day, you're trying to alert everyone, but especially those that are most vulnerable, right? So you want them uh, you want to include them in the numbers as well. So that's what I'll add. Thank you, all three of you, so very much. I can't say how impressed I am by all of your work and how important it is. Um, I, you know, I would say from my perspective, one of the key things that I'll take away from this session is the power for social change from the ground up, because each of you are working with specific communities at risk in different ways. And it is really um, in those places that all of you have created improved health outcomes, regulatory change, I mean, all kinds of social change. And, you know, I think for those of us who've worked in the climate space a long time, we see a lot of climate anxiety, a, a lot of feelings of powerlessness. And I think stories like yours show all of us that we can actually improve situations, create resilience, even in the context of something as life-threatening and seemingly out of our control as the temperature. So I think um, I'll take that away from this session and hope that we'll see more of that in the, in the coming sessions. So thank you three so very much again. And with that, I will turn it over to our next session moderator, committee member, Carlos Martin. Hi, everyone. You can hear me, right? Great. So um, I now that I, I, I'm seeing my face uh, on the screen now, and I, I'm realizing that I have a, a picture that I just took yesterday, um, uh, last week, excuse me, from the Kimball Art Museum, an exhibit on Mayan uh, religious uh, uh, statuary, reminded, which I, I'm thinking now is quite appropriate, given that the Mayan civilization, part of the reasons that the Mayan civilization collapsed, other than obviously colonization and imperialism, was change in environmental conditions. Um, so um, I, I took this last week. It was the same week. Um, that Texas Governor Abbott signed HB 2127, which prohibited any municipality from allowing water breaks um, that differed from federal OSHA requirements. And so um, just things to think about as we enter in this next session, which will be more interactive. We want to make sure we're hearing from everybody who is attending, um, including all of those who are in the room with breakout sessions. So the breakout sessions are divvied up by four categories, and I believe we're going to have these flashed up. Wow, that's a big face. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, uh, by four specific interventions or issue areas that we've identified, and I'll go through those just in, in just a second. So the purpose of these is to identify barriers hindering any kind of implementation. These could include policy, practical barriers, as well as gaps in knowledge. 
So again, today the, today's breakouts are meant to cover the landscape of barriers and problem statements to get us to tomorrow's discussions on solutions. So be as expansive and comprehensive with your barriers and problems as you can, but remember, and you will be prompted by specific categories of barriers like political, economic, social, societal, we will have the moderators in the room make repeat all the things that I'm saying right now. Um, but please know that we have an immediate goal of moving to address them. So you have some additional notes in the agenda around how much time we have. We have a very short amount of time, so let's get into those as quickly as possible. Some of you have been selected to be active participants in these breakout rooms, and you will be given a mic if you are not in the room. Um, you'll obviously be allowed to speak in the room, um, and we will um, have some, I'm assuming there are rooms with breakout uh, identifications here. Great. So in-person attendees can move to their breakout rooms um, here in the Keck Center. Um, staff will set up and start recording the breakout Zoom rooms for note-taking only. Online attendees um, can self-select their breakout rooms, um, but this main room will stay open, as I'm correct. Okay. And become breakout number one. Yes, so everybody knows. Every group is going to have a jam board. Correct. And that will be in the room. So we'll have that all set up. Um, uh, what else should I say? Non-active participants can react. Active participants can react in the chat. Um, we'll review everything that's populated in the jam boards afterwards. So the four topic areas. I'm going to repeat this, but in every session, we'll ask the moderators to make sure that you're repeating these because we had to divvy things up. It may not be the most um, um, artful way of having to divvy this up, but we did these based on who we thought was going to be in the room and why we thought they were different. So the first are natural and built environments. So these are all the interventions, nature-based solutions, as well as indigenous knowledge, uh, blue, green, and gray infrastructure. And this includes facilities like cooling centers, air con residential air conditioning and commercial building air conditioning, roads, other facilities like jails, schools, shelters, transportation, et cetera. So that specific grouping of built environment and natural environment. Second are workers and economic productivity. Here we want to focus on workplaces that may be separate from the facilities that we talked about before. Um, so the consequences of occupational heat exposure on indoor and outdoor workers and their and, and the broader impacts on economic productivity. That's the second. Third are health and healthcare. Are these flashing up as we do people know? It's in the chat. Good. So all this is happening in the background. <laughs> um, health and including my face and my picture. <laughs> health and healthcare is a third, and that um, including the mental and physical consequences of extreme health, especially on vulnerable populations. Okay. Um, and including the first responders and chronic emergency responses. That's the third. Fourth, well-being and social cohesion. So this is more focused on social programming, separate from these other kinds of emergency-related interventions or physical interventions. So this includes the effects of extreme heat on leisure and recreational activities, as well as um, questions around community resilience, social justice and equity that are broader so that are broader social programming focus. Obviously, all four of these sessions have equity components that we could talk about. There's a lot of interaction between these, but this is how we've segregated them. Okay. So one, natural and physical and, and built physical environments, two, workplaces, three, health and health uh, consequences, four, social programming, well-being, social cohesion. Right. Now, you have until 3 p.m. Are we giving people a little bit more now? Okay, 3.02 p.m. You have five minutes to run to your room or stay in the room as appropriate. And that includes the folks in the room, in the virtual room, take a bathroom break while you come back on. Say no later than 3.02 if you can come back because we only have 25 minutes to go through this discussion. Anything I left out? All right, I'm all good. I'm taking myself off. Run to your rooms. <laughs> All right, folks, I think uh, we are ready to get going on our uh, keynote talk, which is uh, Professor Vivek Shandis. So uh, I am um, Mikhail Chester, Professor of Civil, Environmental, and Sustainable Engineering at Arizona State University, and I'm happy to be introducing uh, Professor Shandis. So uh, Vivek, I have known for a long time, and I'm always impressed because he studies uh, vulnerability, but does so in a way that embraces 
the complexity of the cities and environments that he works in. And uh, he's always able to sort of link everything from the built environment to, you know, social considerations, to institutional, to history, and brings it all together. So Vivek, delighted to have you here uh, speaking with us. And uh, thank you again. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. And I'm really humbled to be amongst this esteemed audience of folks who are thinking about this seriously. Uh, I just am literally walking in from a conversation with a local municipal, um, a uh, little local municipality, small town called Gresham in uh, Oregon, and it's been really interesting to see how much of an uptick there was, there has been in the conversations around heat. This is a municipality that hasn't um, really wanted to think about climate change uh, so seriously until very recently, and heat has been something I've been bringing up over and over. Uh, nevertheless, now is a time where a lot of these conversations are really taking shape across the country, and I'm just so thrilled to be here and share some space with you in trying to understand what this might look like on a, um, on a research side, on a practice side, and how to bring those two pieces together. Um, I hope I'm sharing my, I'm sharing. We my can screen. see your slide. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I, I can't imagine that I could share anything that would be beyond the collective knowledge in this uh, room. Um, and so I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief and uh, really leading into kind of what are the what's the call to action here. Um, I've had the good fortune of working as a uh, faculty member researcher, also an advisor to a climate consultancy, which has um, been directly working with uh, municipalities around the country and so and, and increasingly world. And so Part of this work is kind of a bridging of the two hats that I wear, one as a um, researcher and a professor, one as a, a consultant, and trying to really weave the research to practice narrative that I'm trying to um, own in this, in this space. So um, with that, part of where I'm headed with this work is trying to think about heat action planning and centering this issue of urban inequity as we've come to recognize that heat uh, is not something that everyone experiences equally. And so just jumping right in, I want to just start with um, a little bit many, I don't, I know a few of you, I don't know a lot of you. I grew up uh, eight degrees above the equator uh, in the, uh, in a country uh, that's known for its large uh, monuments like this Taj Mahal. And India is also known uh, for having recently experienced some of the most uh, devastating heat waves, as well as uh, floods that have uh, just literally washed out towns and villages. And it's a personal uh, uh, service of mine to want to work on this field in a way that allows me to really reconnect with uh, uh, family members as well as others who are continuing to bear some of the first and worst on a global scale of these climate-induced tragedies. Um, this this uh, a physical monument, the Taj Mahal, is, is very similar to the city I live in now, and you might be asking, how is that possible? Um, nevertheless, uh, what I see as the Taj Mahal and the city of Portland and its built in, uh, envi in natural environments is um, really artifacts of human activity. These are, um, these are outputs from a massive uh, uh, owning of the planet, the, the Holocene, which has brought us un- uh, precedented levels of prosperity, health, and uh, monumental architecture, whether it's spread out or contained. And this artifact, these artifacts are also kind of uh, um, uh, aligned directly with other artifacts, such as heat. Heat is a direct, in the way that it's manifest in this monster that came through the Pacific Northwest is the map of British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho and uh, really getting into the fact that we had a massive heat dome in 2021 that no one anticipated. Nevertheless, I had been crying to municipal managers, public health agencies for over a decade that this was going to be an event. We saw it happen in Chicago. We've seen it happen in Europe. We've seen it happen all over the world. Nevertheless, there was very little direct attention to this uh, issue of heat. And so I've been reflecting a lot on what does it take to work with human artifacts like the like the intensity, frequency, and duration of heat waves that are increasing over time in finding ways to actually move into actions that can help safeguard those communities who are hit first and worst. Um, I wanna start with a few provocations here. 
um, and, and really being around the idea that um, heat is a primary driver of climate induced change. We can talk about forest fires, we can talk about drought, we can talk about sea level rise. Those are all a result of heat. I really wanna underscore that as a, um, as a means by which we're trying to grapple with something that, is, uh, that the earth has not seen for over a hundred thousand years. It really is one of those moments of transformative change and it calls us to act because this is a moment of uh, tr a massive transformation unlike anything human civilizations have seen um, on a scale like we have never known. And so part of what we're trying to deal with is what is the knowledge that's needed to bring this uh, to some level of our ability to manage. And I will uh, suggest and provoke by, suggest by offering the idea that the heat mitigation strategies that we're currently considering lack evaluation and assessment. We're throwing a tremendous amount of resources at this um, with recent passage of various acts, the, the strategies for mitigating heat, the adaptation components of this are still woefully inadequate for us to really know what's going to work and in what context. And the third provocation I, I wanna suggest is uh, if we're going into action, we really wanna be thinking about um, what heat in all policies looks like. How do we integrate this since it falls between the cracks for most municipalities, most uh, counties, most uh, regions, and the federal uh, agencies, how do we kind of develop an understanding of risk when we don't really have a good way of characterizing heat as it plays out in these different locations and these different contexts? Those are three, uh, at least provocations I wanna start with and I wanna keep coming back to them as, as, um, as helpful. Um, given the four components that we just came out of breakout rooms, the natural and built environments, what I'm gonna call occupational exposure, health and healthcare, and then well-being and social cohesion, I wanna to suggest to you that we, in order to get to actions, which are implementation and interventions, we really need to first contextualize and understand the hazard. So those are kind of the top components, if you will, of this center um, target uh, um, image. And part of what we're trying to do is really contextualize and assess the hazard in such a way that we can lead to implementation. And that, lead, and that begins with an understanding of what the risks are. I wanna contend that uh, the risks that we have characterized around heat, they're often reactive. They're things that we are discovering as we see heat waves come through a region. And that until we really are able to get a handle on those risks, we're not really able to take the necessary actions to safeguard communities. And so there's a process by which I wanna suggest that we're moving from understanding of risks to then Taking, inter taking on interventions and implementing the kinds of strategies that we understand will mitigate those risks and move forward. And so that's this idea of moving from risks to resilience that I wanna um, at least frame this up with. The next slide, I just wanna warn you, has more animations than any slide I've ever made in the thousands of presentations <laughs> I've given in classes and otherwise. So please hold on to your seats. I'm gonna to try to walk us through at least one way of bringing these four components together. It's, it's a hypothesis more than it is necessarily a claim at this point. But I wanna start with this idea of uh, natural and built environment, the idea that we have created a set of uh, physical um, distribution of various uh, um, forms of land use and land cover that's based in a history of decision-making that has um, got a set of gray and green infrastructure, building codes, energy grids. It has various strategies like cooling centers already embedded within it. So that uh, drives a lot of what we see in terms of occupational exposure. So what I'm gonna suggest is that the way we've articulated the natural and built environment, something that we have direct control over through our land use and land uh, policies drives much of what we talk about in terms of exposure probabilities, exposure pathways, even sensitivities to various heat related illnesses. And this has to do with things like how um, FEMA uh, looks at uh, or doesn't look at heat in this case, how local labor laws are enforced, um, uh, schools and their air conditioning, uh, the efficacy of reporting, whether someone feels like their employer will actually believe them if they're going about reporting a heat incident or something related to heat illness in their, in their workplace. Of course, outdoor 
and agricultural workers who are completely, agricultural workers completely outside of the labor laws of the 1930s during the New Deal, um, that is something that continues to come up as a acute and uh, insidious uh, uh, impact from rising temperatures. Those occupational exposures then have effects directly to health in the healthcare system in which we're talking about how quickly we can respond to those exposures, what the mental and emotional health are of communities, uh, even in, uh, citizenship status, coping uh, capacities, and trying to understand what access and availability uh, might look like in terms of taking, in terms of health, uh, whether we have access to healthcare, as you, as we all know, a major issue in the U.S. Um, that, that health and healthcare, uh, I want to also suggest there's a set of capacities. Since I have a, I have healthcare in my context, I have additional capacity to be able to partake, to be able to engage, and to be able to uh, be more connected in my um, social network. That, of course, we know drives directly the resiliency of a community. When communities are better connected, they are and more socially cohesive, they are better able to respond to acute pressures, whether it be heat or otherwise. And we've seen this time and time again in the natural hazards literature. Um, Though if you're on the other end, um, you're more isolated, we also know that directly affects our uh, exposure and the extent to which we're able to cope with uh, these, these um, uh, extremes such as, such as heat. So underlying all of these four components, I want to just uh, encourage you to think about what it means to evaluate risk uh, uh, from heat in each of these different areas. That's something you've started to get into with your breakout groups. Part of what this is also about is how do we monitor and assess those uh, natural and built environments that can cool, those uh, occupational path exposure pathways. What is it where someone does or doesn't have healthcare, whether they're willing to access it when temperatures do get hot and when um, monitoring of heat risk could also be meaningful when we have isolated communities like many of whom uh, perished during the uh, heat dome that I mentioned earlier in June of 2021 in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is a uh, monster of a slide, and I um, know there's a lot here. These are, uh, this is an attempt to kind of weave together the four thematic areas, because really underscoring this is not to necessarily isolate one entity. I know for convenience of conversation, it's helpful, but my, my point here is partly that these are incredibly interconnected and intersectional in the sense that they all contribute to our understanding of how do we characterize heat risk. So I want to get it, go from the 5,000 foot down to, um, down to the ground a little bit more by, uh, identif by describing a few projects that help get us closer to the risk uh, assessment that then leads us to an understanding of what actions might be um, helpful. The first is uh, work that we've been continuing to do for the last three years in the city of Los Angeles, where we're looking at um, the role that green space is playing. And this work, more than anything else, is an attempt to try to um, identify where are, the, where are the places where risk might be the highest, and what is the level of investment or effort that could help move a needle on greening those particular areas. Shading those areas is really part of what the agenda here is is how do we think about, um, this is with the uh, Los Angeles first urban forest officer. This is with several community-based organizations working in um, several different parts of LA, including South, South Central LA. Um, we're actually this, this weekend, there's a workshop in Silomar where we're actually working with community-based organizations to understand what kind of uh, risks they might be directly experiencing. So this is work with the community, directly for the community and trying to develop some guidebooks and direction in order for us to find ways to understand who's exposed and in what ways that can be mitigated. Um, second example is really getting at this natural and built environment where we took a, uh, a neighborhood like you see here and we digitized them. These tools are uh, off the shelf. This is, for example, EnviMet, a well-known tool for um, many, for, for over a decade. And we did this several years ago where we took a uh, um, a, a proposal that a municipal uh, manager was putting forward. We want to take 16 units and, and upzone them to 64 units in the city block. And we digitized 
this into the uh, lower left here of what this particular city block would look like. Then in the plans, what we did was uh, array all of the 64 units in different configurations with different amounts of green space. And in the upper right-hand corner here, um, plan 6B, we pr pretty much did similar to what most code allows is asphalt around a multifamily residential development. All these are um, ways to be able to uh, distribute space and distribute um, residential space at that. And what we found when we ran these models is that we were able to, in fact, increase density at, for multifamily residential um, uh, residences and at the same time also uh, keep heat down. In fact, ambient temperature uh, outputs from this model suggest that in plan 6S, this right, the plan on the far right, requires a whole set of different uh, building code modifications as well as um, a few uh, design modifications to allow for this horseshoe shape uh, design, tucking parking under and allowing for lightening of roadways and, and rooftops, uh, green space being brought in and convective currents being moved through the space through gaps in those, in those specific developments. So allowing for that, uh, we would at least estimate that there is a way to reduce up to 1.7 degrees Fair, uh, 1.7 degrees Celsius, the ambient temperature of that overall, whereas uh, plan 6B would increase temperatures by over three degrees Celsius in this example. So that was another way of getting a tool to be able to do some uh, proactive evaluation of what might be possible. We've got papers on this I'm happy to send. A couple of other examples where we're also combining the exposure of, of uh, workers at the port of Tacoma who are unloading and loading lots of massive uh, containers coming in from parts of Asia and other parts of the world. And we wanted to look at it from a multi-month, multi-week perspective of what are the months and weeks where um, it, there is exposure of different uh, communities in terms of their outdoor work. And this was a way where we set up a, a, num a number of sensors in these locations. We were able to monitor over time. We also brought in heat uh, into this and looking at where are we seeing um, the potential worse impacts from air quality, in this case, particulate matter, and the worst case of heat. And how do we kind of put those two together over a month long? And as a result of this work and the previous kind of high density development work, we're already seeing kind of modifications happening at particular times of the year uh, for outdoor workers in the port of Tacoma, which has already been a very contentious conversation to begin with. Um, a third piece I wanna touch on is a project that I'm really excited about and that we'll close and I'll kind of come around the corner here and close out in a minute. Um, but the uh, idea of indoor uh, air conditioning, we've been um, in the Pacific Northwest, we've been throwing air conditioning similar to other parts of the country at uh, this issue of heat. And what we're finding when we actually monitor uh, the temperatures indoors of public housing, these are three public housing buildings of different forms, we're actually finding that AC is not necessarily bringing the temperatures down to the extent that we would have anticipated that they would be brought down. In fact, there were several uh, buildings, and this is just one example on the, on the right, some graphs of outdoor temperatures and indoor unit temperatures, where we're seeing um, uh, temperatures break the 85 uh, Fahrenheit threshold, even with units that have air conditioning running full on throughout uh, the night and day. And this is something, th these are public housing buildings where people died during that uh, heat dome event. Um, we also do a lot of workshops to understand what are the strategies that folks will use in order to be able to cool. And I think, again, this is not lost on many of you. This is probably work very similar to what you're doing, though I was surprised to see how little literature there is on indoor exposure to heat and the extent to which there are strategies for shoring up some of the uh, mitigation and adaptation work. Um, we found, in fact, some residences, um, even without AC, were able to keep their temperatures lower than residences that had AC uh, immediately adjacent to the building, controlling for aspect and several other factors. Uh, uh, Vivette, we're, we're at time, if you okay. could wrap up. Yeah, and I'll just close out here. I'll just... Uh, make a quick shout out for understanding exposure. Um, we've done this work now across 
This is a 2023 map. I think you're, many of you are familiar with this map where we're trying to do social engagements to understand heat. This has been one of the most uh, compelling projects working with national integrated heat health information systems and municipal managers across the country. I think um, this is something that we're continuing to work on. It's made its way into several um, risk monitoring and assessment programs. And with that, I'll just uh, close out with this kind of attempt to show that this requires an understanding of risk in order to get us to actions and I'm happy to engage in conversations um, after as well. So thanks, Mike. Sorry, I took a little longer than anticipated. Um, hopefully that was coherent at least at the end of, end of the uh, presentation. No, that was terrific. Thanks, Vivek. And I would encourage everyone to uh, check out Professor Shondas's work, uh, you know, always uh, sort of at the cutting edge of how we think about vulnerability. Thanks, Vivek. So we have come to the end of our first day of our two-day workshop, and um, Anna and I would like to very much thank everyone for your participation today and your um, thoughts, insights, experiences, our speakers, especially who have just brought such incredible insight to the issues at hand. Um, does someone from the academies, uh, would you like to share logistics for tomorrow? I don't quite have them at top of top of uh the page. absolutely Sabrina why don't you go ahead and and have your take-home messages and that will just wrap up with 30 seconds of logistics perfect so Anna and I have just come up with a, a few of the highlights or themes that we've seen running through today that we hope we will take into tomorrow um and and Anna of course jump in on any of this so one is improving communication about heat and the implications for health um, and this in particular includes valuing nature and community knowledge of these risks and um, experiences. Uh, second is the need to better characterize heat as a risk. And this is both in terms of measurement, data collection, as well as for um, to provide this information to people who could be at risk. Third, the need for correct assessments of risk to affected communities while actions are being implemented, because obviously we are in this already. This year is projected to be the hottest year on record, so we are experiencing it. So valuing, again, local indigenous community level knowledge is an experience. Um, in that process of the correct assessments, it really has risen to the top here today. Um, the potential for using social change approaches to address many of the issues that we've raised. We've heard speakers today who have achieved successes, which probably no one expected and has have created changes that in, improve resilience. And so this is, these are some examples and some insights, some lessons that we can pull from today to tomorrow as we begin to think about solutions. And finally, finally the need to make all of the interventions and to address needs locally. So as we do that, also thinking about how we amplify and scale these interventions so that other communities, localities, states, countries, et cetera, really learn from one another so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel, but also these, um, the address of risk and resilience can be done really, really locally. So. Again, with that, I, we'd like to say thank you to everyone, to our fellow committee members who ha I think have done such an amazing job with the National Academy staff and organizing and preparing for today. So thank you. Thank you to everyone um, for participating in this first day of the workshop um, and to think to, to really putting our minds together to create solutions for the problems that we're already facing, the challenges we're already facing. Um, and I think the last note is the Jamboard, the link for the Jamboard is continue, going to continue to be live now and into tomorrow. We will be integrating what is written in the Jamboard into tomorrow's discussion. So if you will continue to add there, it will inform how we as a group move forward into tomorrow. Um, so please do continue to add and edit and et cetera in the, in the Jamboard. And now I will turn it over to, to Audrey. Thank you. And we're at time. Just come back tomorrow at 2.30. 
be ready to participate, um, continue populating that gem board again tomorrow. It's really in the solutions. We're going to push you toward uh, trying to find this innovative, a little bit on the you know, future looking type solutions where we may not have thought about before. So absorb this, this conversation during the night and come back ready to go to propose what you think hasn't been tried yet. Thank you very much for everybody online and thank you very much for people in the room today and thank you to committee members.